Welcome to Moments in Leadership. I want to start off today's episode by reading a quick review from Apple Podcasts that I really appreciated. Not sure who wrote it, but they write, you have young Marines out here like me with access to not only information, but perspectives as well. Hearing things from the bigger picture is super motivating. I've listened to all the episodes and it not only gives me great ideas on how to lead, but my confidence is also skyrocketing. This is valuable work and it is affecting all of us. I just really appreciate that because I want the project to have that sort of an impact on the young emerging leaders. So when I get feedback like that, it just keeps me really motivated. So whoever wrote that, thank you very much. I, I appreciate that. And, uh, and, and all the reviews that I get, I just can't read them all. I also want to say that if, like that reviewer, you are receiving some benefit from this project, please check out my Supercast account, which is in the show notes below. It's a way for you to help support the project financially. I'm not trying to make any money off of this. I'm just trying to cover my costs. So every little contribution really, really helps. I'm going to take a second and read off the names of all the people who have subscribed so far and are financially contributing to the project. There's 31 people right now. Trevor Hall, Richard Natt, General Dave Bellin, Tom Engel, Zach Queen, Bo Plant, Sean Dudley, Virginia Brody, Joe DiPaolo, Steve Stevenson, Juan Betancourt, Wade Pretty, Shannon Harris, Zach Stiller, Michael O'Keefe, Jack Hanley, Patrick Hobbs, Mike Zummer, Sean O'Grady, John Provenza, Charlie Murphy, Sean Knoll, Brendan Slosser, Chase McGordy Hunter, Caleb Cates, Zach Mutart, Michael Ramirez and Grand Fields. Thank you to everyone who is supporting the podcast at the different levels. I really appreciate it. Additionally, I want to put in a plug for Reagan Roberts over at Mission Essential Gear. Their mission is to develop a community through the appreciation of creative thought, nobility, and philanthropic actions. And I'm using Mission Essential Gear to host some Moments in Leadership t-shirt swag to try to generate a little bit of revenue extra for the project. So there's a link to the show notes to the merchandise below. Go ahead and buy a t-shirt or something and help the project out. Reagan, who's a former Marine, and while it's unfortunate that we've lost his leadership in the active duty Marine Corps, he continues to display his leadership skills in running a small business and helping other veterans sell their merchandise as well. So be sure to check them out and buy some merchandise, whether it's from the Moments of Leadership account or any of the other great vendors out there who are selling merchandise. It not only supports these efforts, but it's going to go to others as well. Specifically, PB Abate is a big recipient of a lot of the donations from Reagan and his efforts there. I want to shift gears real quick and talk about a recent trip I took down to the basic school a few weeks before the Marine Corps birthday ball. I was invited to be a guest at the Delta Company mess night, and I had some great observations from TBS I just want to share with everybody. TBS has really evolved, and take it from me, who was there over 30 years ago, and like Sergeant Major Reynolds said, in his podcast episode, TBS is putting out a great product. But I want to share some of my observations from the last two times I've been down there. The first is that the company staff, the captains and the majors who are who are running the individual companies of lieutenants, they just seem so much more engaged with their lieutenants than when I was there. And I just feel like they've taken on so much more of a, a true mentoring role than than the experience that I had at the basic school, which was the company staff, they were great, don't get me wrong, I, I, I just think it's changed. And where it's more of a, hey, they're the instructors and we're the students and there's not really a, a blending of those two groups, I just feel like there's, there's just a, more of a closeness between the captains and the company commander major and how they are just more of a mentor to the lieutenants than anything else. Here's something else that's really interesting about the basic school that's changed a lot since I was there. They actually have NCOs, I think most of them were sergeants, they have NCOs down at the platoon level. So each platoon is led by a captain and it has an NCO in the platoon. And that NCO is there offering guidance and mentorship to the new lieutenants as well. And in addition to that, the company actually has a first sergeant. That's a huge improvement to when I was there too, because what the lieutenants are seeing is real life mentorship and feedback from a sergeant into everything they're doing on a daily basis. And I just think that that perspective is probably so accretive to the learning that is going on at the basic school and the training of the second lieutenants. And then additionally, for the company to have a first sergeant and for those lieutenants to see how a first sergeant actually operates in a company seems to me to be a very valuable improvement down there at the basic school. So hats off to that. Now, so back to the mess night. I was chatting with the commanding officer, Colonel McClam, and it dawned on me that I don't have a single recollection of my TBS commanding officer. I couldn't tell you other than maybe him standing in a classroom for 60 minutes and giving us a leadership brief. I don't ever remember seeing him or interacting with him in any way. 
And that's not happening down there right now. It, it was so interesting to see the personality and the relatable nature of their CEO down there, Colonel McClam. It's just 100% different from what I remember. And I think it's a positive for the lieutenants to be having some interaction with a full bird 06 colonel and having a much more relatable and interactive relationship with their commander down there. I can just see it. I can just see that there is a huge benefit to that. So huge improvement down there with just the culture. And again, not that there was anything wrong with the way I went through TBS. Things always evolve and they always change. And it's just really, really great to see. I want to talk about a couple individual Marines I met down there at the basic school because each one of them was a really interesting snapshot of the evening. I just want to share it first. I had an opportunity to spend some time with Major Vanessa Segala. She is the TBS JAG. What an interesting conversation to talk to a field grade officer JAG at the basic school and to really understand more about the impact that they're having with the overall training and leadership of the lieutenants. It was really a fascinating conversation and Vanessa, I appreciate the time that you took to sit and chit chat with me. I also had an opportunity to spend a lot of time with the TBS gunner, CWO, for Gerald Eggers. What a fantastic resource for lieutenants down there, and especially the warrant officer students. As he and I got to talking, I made a joke about being old, and he said, oh, there's no way you're older than I am. It turns out I was. So, you know, when you're older than the CWO for gunner at TBS, you're really getting old, so put a perspective on things. But what a great conversation with you, Gunnar. Thanks so much for taking some time and talking to me about your career field, your career, and what sort of impact you're having with the lieutenants and the warrant officers down there. It was really an eye-opening education, and I appreciated the time. Captain John Vieras, who's an artillery officer down there and one of the platoon commanders in Delta Company, who's heading back to Fort Sill for Captain's Career Course. Thank you so much for inviting me down, and more specifically, hosting me at your table with 3rd Platoon. It was really great to be actually out in the crowd with the participants of the mess as a member of the mess. That was very special, and I appreciated the whole evening with you and your lieutenants. Lieutenant Tori Armstrong, great time seeing you, you know, sharing the name. I hope to keep hearing about your successes in the Marine Corps. He's off the infantry officer's course, but he was a former gunny and drill instructor who is now a lieutenant. No doubt he's going to go on to have a great career. So great to see you, Lieutenant Armstrong. And uh, good luck at, at IOC. I also met Lieutenant Jenna McClure, who's off to IOC. Jenna, congratulations on getting your first choice of MOS and heading off to IOC. That is going to be an adventure and probably one of the hardest things you'll ever do in your entire life. And I wish you all the best of luck. And you are undertaking something that I think is probably one of the hardest things that any officer in the Marine Corps can do. So congratulations. And again, thank you for taking some time to talk to me that night. And then finally, Lieutenant Holly Hall, who is my escorting officer who introduced me around the company. Uh, that was really great because I didn't really know everybody down there or anybody down there. So taking some time to introduce me around to the other lieutenants. I really appreciate that. She's off to supply school where she was prior enlisted and she used to teach. She was a former instructor down there at supply school. So she's back off to be a student at the school that she used to teach at. Something tells me I know who the honor grad from her class will be. So again, Delta Company, TBS, thanks for a great time down there. Really enjoyed myself. Quick note on some upcoming guests. I've already cut my recent episode with Lieutenant Colonel Parate, who is the commanding officer of HMLA 267, RA, anytime, anywhere, Stingers. They are off on deployment right now, and that will be the next episode that comes out. I have Sergeant Major Ruiz, who we had a technology snafu and we weren't able to record before he ended up going uh, off on some exercises and was out of pocket for a recording, so we're getting back to him pretty soon. I have General Farrell Sullivan, who took over General Alford's job down in Kiwanico. He's lined up to record in December, really looking forward to that. I also have a Captain Sullivan, U.S. Navy, who will be my first female officer on Moments in Leadership. This is going to be a fantastic episode. Everybody who's been listening knows that I've been excited about getting a senior female officer on to talk about their experiences. She is off to take command of the USS Wasp. So really looking forward to hearing about her sea stories and her ascension up to being the commanding officer of a pretty serious warship. Colonel Reggie McClam, who I mentioned before, is the commanding officer of TBS. He and I are going to sit down and have a recorded episode in January. And then I got a great introduction through a friend of mine, Mark Zinner, to Lieutenant General Greg Newbold, whose name should sound familiar to everybody for a couple of different reasons. One, he well, first of all, he had a fantastic career in the Marine Corps. He was the commanding officer of the Marine Expeditionary Unit that landed in Somalia, which was about... 30 years ago. And he went on to work in the Pentagon as a three-star and is is very well known for his dissension uh, and disagreement with the plan to invade Iraq and actually resigned his commission 
over it. And he and I are going to have a pretty in-depth conversation about moral courage. And then we'll have another hot wash episode with the captains after a couple of those episodes. We have something to talk about. So on to today's episode. I have today First Sergeant Seamus Flynn, who enlisted in the Marine Corps in 2003 and graduated from boot camp uh, on Paris Island in November of 2003. And then after Marine combat training, he attended the Automotive Maintenance Technicians course, graduating from that in June of 2004, went on to serve in the old First Force Service Support Group. And then between August of 2004 and March of 2005, he deployed to Operation Iraqi Freedom for duty as a provisional military police officer. He then reported to 1st Maintenance Battalion, and in September of 2006, he deployed aboard the USS Boxer with the 15th MU for combat operations in Iraq. He then went on to deploy a second time with the 15th MU aboard the USS Peleliu from May through October of 2008. From there, he went on to work at MARSOC, deploying to Afghanistan with Fox Company 2nd Special Operations Battalion serving as their company motor transport chief. Then he went on to Marine Wing Communications Squadron 38 to serve as their motor transport operations chief and headquarters detachment gunnery sergeant. Then he went on to the School of Infantry West, where he notably became the chief instructor trainer and the staff and COIC of the regimental shooting team. Then went on to Truck Company Headquarters Battalion, the 3rd Marine Division, Okinawa, Japan. And in June of 2020, was promoted to first sergeant, his current rank now, and served in the 3rd Law Enforcement Battalion, where he served as the company first sergeant in two different companies, deploying to Guam to assist the U.S. Air Forces in operations on Anderson Air Force Base. Then in May of 2021, First Sergeant Flynn reported to his current unit, which is Weapons Company, 1st Battalion, 23rd Marines, for duty as the Inspector Instructor First Sergeant. His personal awards include four Navy Marine Corps Commendation Medals, four Navy Marine Corps Achievement Medals, one with a Combat Valor Distinguishing Device, and the Combat Action Ribbon. First Sergeant Flynn also holds an associate's degree in liberal arts from Excelsior College. So with that, First Sergeant Flynn, welcome to Moments in Leadership. Hey, Dave. Thanks for having me. Uh, first time podcaster here, so bear with me. So worth mentioning, you're you're down in, in Austin, Texas for your current billet, and we'll get to some conversation about that. But you know, first question, just to kind of kick things off is, what was Seamus Flynn like when he was a senior in high school, and why did he join the Marine Corps? Well, the question about why I joined the military, you know, that goes back way, way farther than that. I mean, it was just always something I was very, very interested in. You know, I've been reading military history, either in, you know, fiction or, you know, literal form uh, for my whole life. You know, favorite book growing up was The Killer Angels, Michael Shera uh, about the Battle of Gettysburg. You know, just those fictional accounts of historical characters uh, were written so well that it just kind of, just kind of captured me, you know. Senior year of high school, I had already made the decision to join. I was already signed in the delayed entry program. After a brief conversation with the United States Army, you know, I was talking a little bit with them about being a heavy equipment operator with an airborne contract for one of the airborne divisions. But, you know, I was in the garage one day by myself after work with my dad. The phone rang and Staff Sergeant Lee uh was on the other end from the United States Marine Corps, asked me to come in. I said, sure, I'll come by in a couple, you know, a couple hours, went in. I kid you not, I sat down, and the first thing he said to me was, uh, if you're not serious, get the fuck out of here. Nice. I was like, oh, okay, okay. And it just was a different, it was a different look. So ended up having two recruiters, Staff Sergeant Stephen Lee. He ended up going uh, 8412 crew recruiter and moving up to the uh, – probably moving up to the RS. Uh, and then we got uh, Sergeant Jason Auger. So Staff Sergeant Lee was a mortarman, Somalia veteran. And then Sergeant Auger was a uh, military police officer. And I could not have asked for a better experience with my recruiters. Everything from teaching me, you know, the basics of drill I would need for recruit training. Uh, there was a little, I guess you'd call it like a pulley book back then with a bunch of information rank insignia, uh, history of the Marine Corps, et cetera. I had that entire thing memorized by the time I left. They pulled no punches about the Corps, and it, it was great. Yeah, perfect, perfect recruiters. Uh, senior year, let's see here, was really defined by the mentality of finally getting to do something that I knew I wanted to do, you know, join the, join the military, join the Marine Corps, wrestle my senior year, did okay had a winning record. I was never that great of a wrestler, but the crazy part was when the state of Connecticut, like health board people came around to do the 
body fat testing before the state championships, I had too little body fat to wrestle in state championships. I was wrestling the 160 weight class with a few pound allowances. So I think I weighed around like 166 to 165. They did the body fat analysis with a caliper and I didn't have enough body fat. So I couldn't, I couldn't wrestle. I wasn't healthy enough according to them. I'm just a skinny. Anybody who knows me knows I'm a naturally skinny guy. Did a little bit of track and field after that, which really was just to be part of something organized. My main hobby, I guess you could say, would be, uh, you know, riding riding BMX, bicycle motocross, you know, dirt jumps, skate parks, did a little bit of racing. I've always enjoyed sports where it was an individual contest over a team contest for whatever reason. I can't really define it, but, you know, that's why I like wrestling individual. You know, there's nobody out there to make excuses. If you lost, you lost. And that's kind of how BMX was with, you know, as a challenge. Obviously, I enjoy teamwork. I've been in the Marine Corps for over 19 years now, but in high school, I would say that the individual sports or individual challenges were more my jam. But let's fast forward to your very first unit and talk to me about some of the experiences that you remember from your first couple of years in the Marine Corps as a E2, E3. What were some of your NCOs like? What do you remember about the, your first introduction to your actual unit, your your onboarding, your fir- your very first first sergeant, your very first sergeant or corporal, mm-hmm. and what were some of those memories, those crystallizing moments that just have stayed with you for 19 years? I joined in this interesting time. It's almost a bit of like a transition time, right? So I joined the Marine Corps in August of 2003 and asked for Camp Pendleton, got Camp Pendleton at the end of the training. I knew via my recruiter, Jason Auger, that IMF was going to be going downrange to Iraq, right? So I kind of knew that the chances of me getting on a combat deployment within my first year were were very high. You know, I get to the fleet and the fleet is still like half the Marines are wearing, you know, M81 Woodland BDUs with leather shined boots. If you're a boot or just like, you know, lazy back then, right? You went and bought the digitals, you know, but you know, half of us are still wearing Alice 782 gear. Some people have the new interceptor vest at the time. It ju- it was just this transition from a, there was a lot of transitions. You had a gear set transition from the 80s and 90s. You had a bit of a mentality transition, which, you know, we'll kind of get into some of that 1990s stuff later on. And you had a lit- literal transition into a wartime, a wartime environment, right? So. Getting to the fleet, my first unit, and kind of a long description here, right? So Combat Service Support Company 122, Combat Service Support Battalion 12, First Force Service Support Group, which you will remember from back then, right? This is precursor to the Marine Logistics Group, the MLG right now. Trained as a 3521 vehicle mechanic, showing up to a small shop in a 22 area of Camp Pendleton. That entire shop had been in the march up to Baghdad, right? So, you know, I'm, I've got Lance Corporals, you know, and I'm already Lance Corporal, by the way, because I had received a meritorious promotion in recruit training for being a squad leader. And then I had been in MOS school for so long that I showed up to the fleet as a Lance Corporal. I had Lance Corporal counterparts that, you know, had been in straight combat. They had, you know, been on five tons, or maybe if they were lucky in the back of a seven ton, you know, engaging the enemy. These are these are mechanics, right? These are motor T operators from a logistics element, right? So it was interesting because on top of showing up to a new unit and being a boot, like they just got back from a combat tour. Now you really feel like you need to kind of, you know, step it up or prove yourself. But the thing with me is from those, those, those first years, I was just so happy to finally serve. Like, you know, people, you know, when I was younger, I was probably, you know, I was definitely a recruiter's dream. You know, I did what the journal circus told, move fast, be loud you know, listen, MCT, just so happy. I was only 17 days back then, but I was happy just to serve, right? And the same thing in the fleet. And th- the thing is, a lot of, we, we lose a lot of young Marines in the MOS school because of like Marines awaiting training, or it feels like a bit of a redundant, you know, kind of like puppy mill thing that never affected me. I was so pumped to finally get to the fleet and serve, especially since they sent me to Southern California. Like, I mean, 
the first time I bit into a carne asada burrito in San Clemente, Texas, it like changed my life. I'm telling or San Clemente, California, it just changed my life. I was just so happy to finally serve. And, you know, I'll tell you that that first deployment, you know, I got put on a uh, I got put on a security platoon out of CSSB seven. So out of 29 Palms, we deploy over to Al Assad and it's a mixture of military police and every other MOS you can really think of from the MAGTAF just thrown into a convoy security unit. No joke, right? You know, we, we are going outside the wire. We are escorting the logistics trains in the Western part of Iraq. So we're going as far as Camp Korean Village, Walid and Trabil on the Syrian and Jordanian border. We're going out to Fob Wolf. We're going to Haditha Dam. We're going down to Ramadi and, and you know, we're going to hit or heat, depending on which veteran you talk to who served there. And there's a threat, right? And and I'll tell you back then, many of the security platoons, security contingents that we'll call them, that were thrown together within the FSSG, probably within the Marine Air Wings, we didn't really really receive any training whatsoever. So back up a little bit. It's July and August of 2004, and we are training kind of to go to Iraq. Dave, I literally had to order the M240 Gulf MCI and the Marine Rifleman MCI, the paper ones, remember? Mm -hmm. Sure. Just to get some type of reference material, because this is prior, I didn't own a computer back then. Smartphones didn't exist back then. Just to get some type of reference material so we could get prepared for this because we didn't really know we were going into all we knew was we're going over as convoy security it's a bad threat it's an ied threat small arms fire you name it i mean iraq 04 i mean the first round of fallujah had just i guess been halted pretty bad so it was interesting you know so that that deployment we had good nco leadership good staff and co leadership I, i mean i had a I had a staff sergeant who only called me Sergeant Major because <laughs> I was so motivated, right? <laughs> yeah. But let me ask you a question about that real quick before you move on from it, because you just said like you're ordering MCIs and you're trying to get the training and all this stuff, but you checked into a unit. You you were in a FSSG unit, right? So right. you were at least at a battalion level. Mm-hmm. So you had a battalion commander, you had a three shop, you had a sergeant major, you had a, a company commander, a platoon commander, a a platoon sergeant, you had NCOs, you sergeants, corporals, you're a Lance corporal coming in there and ordering MCIs on basic weaponry. Like what were some of the leadership things that you learned about that, that, that you applied in the future? Because to me, when I hear you say that, I think to myself, what the fuck was going on in that unit? If Lance Corporal Flynn is ordering all the training pubs and everything, I mean, was there a failure of leadership there? And if there's so, if so, is it, were there some lessons learned that were important to you that, that we can talk about? In hindsight, I think the lack of, I guess, either training facilities or training equipment was probably because we were a Camp Pendleton platoon thrown together to meet up with a 29 Palms battalion in okay. two months. And I think because we had a reservist gunny in charge of us, great guy. I just think that it was one of those things like, oh, you'll get the training when you get there. You get the training when you get there, right? It didn't happen. We were thrown onto onto uh, you know convoy operations immediately. But my lesson going forward and yet, actually, this made me really think about this. Young leaders can make training happen. That's all there is to it. And yeah. every place I've gone, I've been with every single type of operational major subordinate command in my career. Everywhere I've gone, I've been able to make training happen. Right. Right. And a young leader, because I get this all the time on Instagram, like we don't train first sergeant. How can we train? Well, you know, there's a lot of elements that need to happen. I mean, I was a, even fast forward, I, I went to a combat mar- marksmanship coaches course as a staff sergeant with an entire class of Lance Corporals because I wanted to have the MOS on the range, right? I wanted to be able to mm-hmm. be the guy who's like, hey, I can make this happen, right? But as a young Marine, sometimes you just have to, you just got to do it, you know? And so we're right. we're sitting there, we're doing, you know, moving from column to wedge formations in the middle of Las Polgas, right? Marching or patrolman by the 14th Marine Regiment or 11th Marine Regiment, sorry, you just have to make it happen. Sometimes you do. And there's a lot of things as a young Marine, there's a lot of things that you can do without a training facility and without live fire, right? I mean, I think we can agree that we can all do the basic preparations of patrolling without a range. We can do... Yeah, you can do it in a parking lot. Correct. We can do 
tactical combat casualty care without a medical facility or without live tissue training, right? That can be done mm -hmm. during PT with a tourniquet and, a, and an old H bandage. And part of it for me, it's it just, just seek employment, right? Like I never wanted to be the person who was just trying to, trying to skate because that did exist back then, right? And I was like, at the end of the day, we're going on a combat tour. Like we need to be prepared. If, if nobody's preparing us, I'm going to do it, right? Because you never know, you know, that deployment didn't end up turning like super kinetic, kinetic or anything. There were some bad stuff happened in that deployment, but it wasn't, it wasn't like anything I'd see later on. So when you, when you check into this unit, young, impressionable Lance Corporal, you've got Lance Corporals that have already been to combat, which means you've got corporals and sergeants that have already been to combat. What were some of the things that you remember about them that were either good or bad as a leadership quality that are worth talking about? And, you know, to people listening, maybe a story about, hey, whatever you do, don't do this. Or, hey, here is something that that really shaped my style now as a first sergeant. Yeah. Right. Like I like to tell the story about my very first battery commander was probably one of the most important formative relationships I ever had in the entire in my entire career. What what was your initial good or bad formative crystallizing moments when you're looking at leadership? Yeah. You know, you're looking up at your leaders. I'll start with the bad actually. My very, very first shop, there wasn't a lot of NCO involvement out in the lot or in the shop with the conduct of maintenance. Unfortunately, a lot of the NCOs, you know, they all were still wearing their old, their old camis with their, you know, fishing line pressed in there and their starch and this and that. And they would just sit around the table on the inside of the bay because they didn't want to change out of that uniform and put coveralls on, right? They didn't want to scuff their, their, their nice shiny boots up, right? I got sent out onto a five-ton wrecker Right. So an old 936 wrecker from your time in the Marine Corps. Oh, thanks. I appreciate that. Right. Yeah. I was told to <laughs> conduct some repairs yeah. on it a week in the fleet. Somebody had parked it, left it in drive instead of putting it in neutral and setting the parking brake. I had to take the drive line out. The last bolt would not come out. Couldn't figure out why. What it was is all the tension from it still being in drive parked on the ground. Last bolt snaps and hits me right in the face. Black eye. First week in the fleet. And there was just no oversight out there, right? There was no young NCO leadership out there monitoring the young, brand new Lance Corp. Like, I, I knew tools. Like, I'm, I was a capable person, but I was not a, a trained mechanic before I joined. Like, my experience was being gained as I turned wrenches and as I worked on service request after service request. And later on in my career, as a maintenance chief, I was very involved out in the lot. And on the floor, that involvement can prevent injury, right? That involvement can prevent accidental waste and abuse of equipment being broken. And to be honest with you, that involvement is what the young Marines want. Like, you know, before I got promoted first arm, one of the final things I did is I, I was under a Humvee in Okinawa with, at the time, PFC Tim Outen, who has got out of the Marine Corps so, uh, since. And I was teaching him how to retap threads on a hole and you know because he had been trained in school but he didn't remember all right here's a leadership opportunity right here's a learning opportunity get under there reteach him how to do it you know have him finish the last part of it boom in my first enlistment fast forward to i was in you know we got back from that iraq tour and it was in first maintenance battalion now so it's lost polgus everything turned into the mlg Interesting place, you know, you're only, you know, you're removing engines, transmissions, transfer cases. We did the armor, the Mac armor set for the 13th Mew when that Mac armor kit first came out. We thought like, right. oh, we're going to be IED proof now. No way. They just got blown off the trucks, right? Put my hand up to go to the Mew. Who wants to go to the Mew? Everybody wants to go to the Mew, right? Like, I mean, the Marine Expeditionary Unit is literally the Marine Corps' crisis response force, right? You may go to combat, you may go and do a non-combatant evacuation operation, you may do humanitarian operation, and you're probably going to get some liberty, right? You're probably going to get go see some cool places. Right. Like, Yeah, no matter where you go. I, I mean, I, don't you wish we could put every Marine on a Mew, right? I, I mean, we just, we, we can't. I know, it'd be great. Just get rid of the bases and just get all the Marines out on ships. Just everybody floating. <laughs> right, yeah, exactly. So I go to 15th Mew, CLB 15. 
Combat Logistics Battalion 15. And I get there and automatically start meeting phenomenal leaders, and one of which who I'm still absolutely friends with, mentored by to, to this day. I'll save him for last. First one, Staff Sergeant Williams, Xavier Williams, who was a sergeant when I got there. You know, 10 years, time and service sergeant. That's how it was back then. It wasn't a it wasn't a frowned upon thing like it was in 2010 for whatever reason that happened. Steph Sergeant Williams, awesome guy, level-headed. I don't think I ever saw him knee-jerk react to anything technically and uh, tactically proficient, right? And when I say tactically, like tactical employment of motor, motor transport assets, right? Tactical employment or methods of performing maintenance, right? When you have your gear on. A generally, a generally uh, happy person, right? There was none of the like older 1990s, like knife hands and weird diddy bop language stuff. I used to remember like people talking about, like I'm, I remember staff and COs, young staff sergeants back then. And a lot of it was a, probably a bleed over from the drill field. But remember people always calling things mine, like go get my toolbox, even though it's issued to you. Like, you yeah, know, sure. Go take my trash can out, blah, 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 blah. Like that mentality, I've never understood it. I go so far to not say my, that even when I talk about students that were under me, I try to say our students. It, it was a student in our combat instructor school class, right? Because I don't understand the, the possessive uh, language. It just, it turned me off in 2003, 2004, and I've, I've always tried to avoid it. Right. Steph Sergeant Williams was just, he, he was a present, interested, and dedicated 3529 motor transport maintenance chief. And oh, by the way, he was also in better shape than like all of us. So that's a bonus, right? You know, being in shape doesn't make you a leader, but all leaders are in shape. I think we can agree on that. That's a great way to put it. Yeah. I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about the battalion commander. You know, you're a young corporal. How much interaction do you really have with a battalion commander on a daily basis on an average battalion or squadron across the Marine Corps? Like probably not that much. Lieutenant Colonel Himes, I, do, I don't remember his first name. Uh, I remember he was a bigger guy, football player. I believe he was from Oklahoma. The Combat Logistics Battalion 15 building to this day is still all in the same warehouse, except for the, including the maintenance shed. And then you have the separated motor pool. Every single morning, Lieutenant Colonel Himes would have his cup of coffee and he would make his rounds to every single detachment in his battalion and say hello. Isn't that amazing that we're sitting here talking about the fact that somebody simply got off their ass with a cup of coffee, walked around and made their rounds every morning. Like, yep. Yeah. And he knew because there was two, there was two detachments in CLB 15 that worked longer hours than everybody else. And that was maintenance and supply. He knew that if he got there after his PT, you know, it's, it could be six forty five in the morning, there would be maintainers under trucks. So he would come by, Every morning, you'd say hello. And it, we got to the point where we knew that when Lieutenant Carl Himes was coming by, like if we're actively turning wrenches, we're not getting out of the truck, standing up and, and getting a parade rest. Like he genuinely wanted to know how everything was going. You know, I didn't have a lot more interaction with him. You know, there was definitely a few raids we supported in Iraq because we floated and then ended up going to Iraq again out to the Korean village area and the city of Rupa, which the city of Rupa was a sent prior had just been surrounded by traffic control points and there was an insurgency inside the city. CLB 15, we supported the reconnaissance assets for the MU and then the BLT, 2nd Battalion, 4th Marines, particularly uh, Echo Company, doing raids around that city prior, supporting Blakewater 0326, old Blake Flannery. Nice. Was yeah, in that sure. platoon, right? And sometimes Colonel Himes would come out on some of those raids, so I'd have a, some more interaction with him. But at this point, I'm not only a mechanic, I'm a wrecker operator as well. So I'm a tow truck driver, right? And there's definitely some lessons to be learned from the workup to that MU and then the conduct of all those recoveries and maintenance. I will say that training pays off. We got to the point where we could recover, a, we could front lift to recover a Humvee in like five minutes. And, you know, when you're under indirect fire attack, you know, via mortars while you're conducting the recovery, it's probably good that you can get out of there in five minutes because LAR doesn't just want to sit there with their, you know, arguably pretty big target for LAB 25s, right? Yeah, while right. you're hooking for tow. 
I do remember a couple of recon Marines and I don't remember their name. They rolled into our compound and were almost off work, right? You know, if you're ever off work as a motor team mechanic in Iraq and like, Hey, the transmission won't shift. We have a raid at zero five. Can you help us? And our mentality was, and this should be every, if you're a, if you're a maintainer in the Marine Corps, your shop's never closed in combat ever because somebody is going to take that asset and they're going to use it to get to a place where they can shoot somebody in the face. That's, that's what it comes down to. I don't know if you're literally referring to, you know, 24 hour ops or if you're figuratively, but meaning that you're always in maintenance mode because somebody's <laughs> taking that asset out in the morning. But from a leadership perspective, I mean, how are you operating a 24 hour maintenance cycle with your maintainers? Was, was it just, Hey, we're going to blunt force, get this done. Was there actual, were leaders sitting down and saying, let's relate, let's talk about sleep plan, rest plan, collateral duties, that's you know, what personal was. time off to do laundry, stuff like that. Yeah. yeah that, that's so what so talk about some of those leadership yeah. lessons learned, because I think that's important. Yeah. So we, we also had uh staff sergeant, Pat Stevens, uh, and we had uh master sergeant, Chris Martinez, Pat Stevens retired as a first sergeant, Mar uh, Chris Martinez retired as a master guard sergeant. We were very deliberate. We were not keeping Marines at that compound if they didn't need to be there. The, the hooches were, the sleeping quarters were literally like 50 meters from the shop, right? We had a lot of Marines in that platoon, particularly who really were all about getting after it in the gym. The gym was pretty close. The dining facility was a little farther away, but we had the ability to rapidly contact people if something had to happen, right? If a piece of equipment came in that needed to be fixed now, we could get them from the gym, from the, the dining facility, get them from the barracks. So if there wasn't anything going on at the shop, or we knew that maybe something was coming down, somebody was on recovery duty for that night, we weren't just keeping people at the, the shop. Because, you know, Top Martinez and Staff Sergeant uh, Williams and Stevens, they, they, they had done this prior. They knew that a regular day, an eight-hour day uh, as, a, as a ground maintainer in the, in, the, in the Marine Corps when you're deployed could easily turn into a 24-hour day. You know, what if you're a mechanic and you're on duty for the record that night? I had multiple days where I would be up for well over 24 hours because there was an IED strike. But you have to teach the Marines that what they do it has value. And, and going back to that recon story, recon comes in, they need a transmission. It's me and a, and a busted down PFC, Steve Dundaro, phenomenal guy. He just drank a little bit too much and knocked the corporal out. Roger that. We will. We got a replacement. Uh, supply has it in the nine block, and we are going to replace that transmission. We stayed up all night, and two 0321s stayed with us, probably because they had you know comm gear inside the, the truck or a bunch of machine guns or whatever it was. But regardless, they stayed there all night with us while we fix that truck. And when you fix a truck, you test drive it and it's done and you watch an entire team of, you know, or element, I guess, of O three twenty ones load up and go meet their formation and roll out that gate to go, you know, shoot people in the face, you know you did something as an enabler, right? Yeah. You know, a combat service support marine, but I like to use the term enabler, right? You just made that happen, right? Everybody has their piece in the war fighting machine, right? Like that's why the Marine Corps is so successful because people take that piece so seriously while still acting like as a basic rifleman and being prepared to fight and all that. So as you were, as you were experiencing some of those operations, what were some of the notable things that you noticed about your leadership, right? Like, cause you had a first sergeant, mm -hmm. you, you had, you had a platoon sergeant or a sergeant major. What, what were some of your observations at that point in your career about the way those men or women were leading? Most of that is going to be within the within the maintenance platoon. You know, as a young sergeant at that point, like I wasn't super, I didn't have a lot of conversations with the sergeant major. There wasn't a first sergeant in a, there is not a first sergeant in a CLB for the MU. But, you know, Master Sergeant Martinez, he just cared. They cared. They were dedicated. They could have a conversation with everybody in the platoon from PFC. I mean, but back then, you know. You know, don't cross some people, right? Because you know you may end up you may end up on your face after you did something dumb in in top's office, which is fine, right? Maybe not these days, but you know back then that kind of stuff, you know, taught some lessons, right? They were dedicated. Again, they would come out, they would be with the Marines. Like, you know, I always hear people say, like, oh, I never saw my staff and CEOs when I was sergeant and below. Like, 
or I was a Lance Corporal below. Like, I don't know if you, if you were a Lance Corporal in maintenance debt of CLB 15, you saw your staff and CO from each section. Cause remember that maintenance detachment is ordnance, comm, engineers, utilities, and motor transport, right? There's a staff and CO for each one of those MOS fields, dedicated guys, all of them. They really did care and they would have the conversation with you about anything, which I thought was very important. Uh, they weren't standoffish. They didn't act as if they, they rated something different because they were, you know, they were staff and COs. And honestly, I think they kind of knew that they had to be out there. Sometimes the, the young Marines just don't know. They, they haven't turned a wrench on that thing yet, right? They haven't come across this complex situation yet. They would be out there to lend their, their perspective, right? Which was, which was great. So when you look back and, you know, you're a sergeant at that point, were there any noticeable moments where like you watch some of your leaders have to make tough decisions, important decisions, or were there any moments that you saw where they were shaping those decisions as a senior leader? And did any of those leave a lasting impression on you? So here's what I'm going to talk about. Ryan Hendricks. He is a current, one of the senior master gunnery sergeant engineers in the Marine Corps. He's stationed up in the Pacific Northwest. Back then, he would have been Gunny Hendricks. He was the engineer chief for CLB-15. We were all sent down to a, a small outpost outside of Rupa to conduct combat logistics for Echo-24, force, you know, force reconnaissance, and the 3rd Reconnaissance Battalion element as they pushed through the city. And it was hard work, right? You know, Ryan would be out there every single day with his Marines, right? And, you know, building school projects, you know, endless, endless HESCO barriers, you know, the tram kept breaking, you know, so we're out there working on it. And, you know, Gunny Hendricks was there with his guys. Like, you could tell he was tired, bags under his eyes, like, and he was there. And, you know, one of the hardest things I think I saw happen I was sitting in the, in a HESCO house outside of Rupa reading, get a knock on the door and Ryan comes in. He says, I got to let everyone in here know that Sergeant Major Ellis was killed in action today in Barwana. And, you know, this is a really hard one, but they need us out in the city and I need everyone to gear up and we got to roll out now. Right. And, you know, Ryan you know, would have been in the chief's mess with Sergeant Major Ellis, right, on the float. Sergeant Major Ellis was blt 24s Tyne Sergeant Major. Phenomenal leader. You know, you look at a Sergeant Major, and that's so far away from being a junior sergeant, you know, with only a couple of years in the Marine Corps. You know, Sergeant Major Ellis, he would stop by and he would talk to the maintainers and the CLB who were working on his stuff, right? You would see him talking to Lance Corporals. I know that Ryan Hendricks was taking a lot of mentorship and just even just by example from Sergeant Major Ellis and, you know, for Ryan to come in, have to break the news that somebody, a senior, one of the, what, five, 80, you know, senior 8999s in the 15th Mew was just killed in action by suicide vest, right? With a number of other Marines. It took some like, moral courage i'm sure for ryan to to you know give us that order and we had to go back out in in the town where people had been dying by the way there was a sniper in rupa that was killing that was killing people so i always thought about that like no matter what happens you need to be able to execute right and you know execute with a clear mind and clear head and get out there and do what needs to be done because somebody needs your support did ryan Hendricks at that point did he did he take the position of like okay listen we're going I'm going with you. Was he out there Absolutely. on the front? Was Is that how? Yeah, because I, I really think that that's one of the things that you've got to do as a leader. And, and again, I don't like telling too many of my own stories on my own podcast where I have guests, but I was in 14th Marines when there was a really bad Howitzer inboard explosion with a 10th Marines out at, oh, geez, where was it? I think that it was in um, Fort Bragg and when they were must have been doing a Rolling Thunder or something. And they got to the bottom of why it happened, but no, there was always this specter of disbelief, sort of like, is that really what happened? Was it really a fuse? Was it, you know, and people start imagining it could be worse. And everybody was scared to go out and shoot again the next time because of what happened. We had a live fire exercise coming up and we were, they lifted the restrictions that we were allowed to go to the field and fire. And I just remember thinking like, I've got to have my entire leadership down there standing on that gun when they fired their first round. Otherwise they're going to think we're all scared of this happening too. And, and I think one of the things I learned from that, and I think you're saying you learned from that too, is that when there's a, a catastrophic incident, when something happens, 
that's the time as a leader, you need to stand up and expose yourself and be a part of whatever's going on right there next to the men and women. Because if you don't, you'll lose a lot of credibility and all you'll do is stoke more fear. Right. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, Ryan Hendricks has continued to be a, you know, he's like mentor actual in the, in the Marine Corps. You know, he is just the epitome of what a staff non-commissioned officer should be. You know, this guy is extremely proficient at his job. He is in phenomenal shape for, you know, for, for 27 or eight years time in service, right? He cares. He remembers your kids' names, right? He stays with you. He contacts you. I, I mean, I've done three deployments with him, two MUSE and then a MARSOC deployment. That was well over a decade ago that we got back off that MARSOC deployment, right? Still stayed in mm-hmm. contact with him, you know, go have lunch with him, talk with him, you know, in Okinawa or disconnect. That's the, one of the best things about social media, right? You know, you can still connect with people. I mean, if there was a master gunnery sergeant of the Marine Corps, right, it would be Ryan Hendricks, right? You know, yeah, we, need to, we need to look into making that billet. Just phenomenal leader. And the way that he was like hands on, still interacting with people, but still giving his engineers like the latitude to still give observing decentralized command, right? It was impressive. So absolutely somebody that I will always, always think about and, and try to model myself after. Yeah. Since we're kind of on topic, it's a good it's a good segue over to a question I like to ask people who have served in combat, or really it doesn't have to be in combat, but in your case it can be either peacetime or combat. But I don't think anybody goes through a career twenty years or even five years where there isn't some moment where they're really scared. And, and I don't mean like frightened; I mean scared. Right? You're you're airborne qualified, so you'll know what I mean when I say this. But like you know, the very first time you jump out the door, that's you're scared, right? Yeah. So it doesn't have to necessarily be this like combat violent event but do you and so now as you're a first sergeant and a senior leader do you look back and do can you recall a moment where you were really scared and then can you use that as an example to help younger leaders who are listening actually prepare for what will become an inevitable moment in their lives so we had a uh, we had a marine killed in action a a couple marines killed in action during my marsoc deployment and uh one of them was Billy Widowitz, uh, Sergeant uh, William Widowitz from Groton, Massachusetts, critical skills operator. So, you know, he's a raider. He's a motocross rider. After he was killed in action, nobody would ride his his motorcycle, right? And on those missions up there in Bala McGraw, you know, I can, I'm a pretty decent rider. So the team chief, he asked me to come out on the mission because there was some significant terrain and he knew that he was going to need people to do overwatch. Right. But I, I do remember getting on that bike and it was one of my last, my last missions in Afghanistan. We had just had two KIAs in that area. The first had been staff Sergeant David day, EOD tech. And I was absolutely scared sitting there. I'm like, I've got it neutral. I'm revving the engine. You know, I'm all kitted up, arguably some of the best shape of my life. I have been in, dozens of uh, events in that deployment, which had prepared me for to be a, a legit enabler, right? But about to roll out the wire on somebody else's bike when you, who had just been killed in action, when you know that they're, you know, an IED threat in the area. Yeah, it was scary. It was, it was scary. And I was like, well, you know, keep your eyes peeled, look for those key indicators for IEDs, but you've got to execute, like you have to do it. One thing that I, that kind of leveled me out especially in that deployment was you got to trust your, in your training and trust in your instincts, right? Like if you're training appropriately, you know, if you're, if your recruiter is preparing you, if your drone instructors are preparing you, your combat instructors, your first NCOs and staff NCOs, like within the basics, right? If you are observing brilliance in the basics for combat, mm-hmm. you are prepared. That is a solid foundation, right? And you just need to, you know, need to trust in yourself, trust in that training and trust in the team. You know, I also got lost. I, I got lost outside the wire one day in thick fog in Afghanistan with on all I had on me was a M9 pistol and a, and a lens at a compass with two frag grenades. You know, we were out there doing some mortar stuff and we got all separated and I had to literally dead reckon my way back. Right. And then shoot an azimuth with a compass to get back to get back to base. Right. How did I get back? Brilliance in the basics, right? I'm a mechanic who still practices and uses the compass, right? What I would say is trusting in your team, 
trusting in a foundation of the basics will win the day. And so is it that leaders need to instill confidence and help people prepare for being scared through through the training? Is there something that they can do to to start to visualize how they'll act in that moment of fear? Because I mean, I, I, I recall the first time I was really scared. And I just remember thinking that the moment frozen time, it was a very strange emotional reaction. I find it when I when I relive it in my imagination now, 30 years later, I imagine that I could have done things differently or what, but I remember just how everything slowed down. Everything was just this almost like frozen in time for a second. But in reality, it's it's not frozen in time, right? You're you're out there executing. And so I I, I try to challenge people who are on the show. It's like, you know, is, is there something can you relay how you actually remember feeling? And and because I, I feel that if people can imagine what it's like, they'll be more equipped, even if it's just using their imagination. It's sort of okay. like, at least you've got some sort of mental experience. You've tricked yourself into thinking you've been there before just a little bit. I, I look back on my thing and I think, geez, if I had, if I had known that there was, I'll just give you the example. If I had known that there was going to be that much smoke, dust, dirt, debris, concrete chips flying around, I never visualized that as being a, an environmental component to combat until it actually happened. And I distinctly remember thinking, holy shit, there's a lot of shit flying around right now. Yeah. You know, playing army when I was a kid out in the backyard with my pop gun. I, you know, you just don't, you don't think about that kind of stuff. I wonder if you experienced anything like that. So my, my first point on mental preparation for combat, read, read mm -hmm. historical events, whether it is, you know, books, you know, books about an event, read, you know, try to find, you know, after actions. And these days watch YouTube, like the like the American Veterans Center or whatever it is they they interview in depth interview World War II Korea Vietnam veterans about the combat experience but educate yourself on other people's experience because the human body is not so physically different that you know for everyone's going to have a different physical reaction to combat everyone may have their own mm -hmm. mental you know there are a few things that would happen to me that were consistent when it was a real life time is life situation so a combat situation my mouth goes very dry huh and yeah see that's the kind of stuff i'm talking about people don't okay think so about that. my mouth goes very dry and what makes it even worse is i i'm constantly dipping copenhagen right so mm -hmm. if i would get into an engagement while i had a, a dip in my in my mouth it was i mean i'm literally shooting at somebody and like trying to rip the freaking dip out of my mouth and get into my water because I can't, I couldn't like function because it was, I'm talking extreme, extreme cotton mouth as a reaction. Dave, I actually have the opposite experience in the beginning of many of my engagements where everything was going extremely fast. Okay. Mm -hmm. You know, one engagement I was in, you're dealing with a casualty, you're dealing with a partnered force that is, you're trying to manage a partnered force, right? you're dealing with being in a, in a bad position. You know, I, I don't think a ranger file is a, is like the best tactical position for anybody, but it's an Afghanistan thing, right? We were always in ranger file just because of the IEDs. Sure. I remember everything going a million miles an hour and having to consciously snap myself out of it. Because when you have, when you have so much sensory overload, it can become too much for the human brain, right? You know, one particular day we got hit so close by, you know, PK, PKM machine guns that, you know, in my experience, there's three different sounds when it comes to being engaged by small arms fire, right? There's mm -hmm. a crack similar to what people hear when they're sitting in the pits in the rifle range. There's a zoom that is very, very close to you, right? And then there is... It is so loud that that's how close the enemy is to you. And in that particular instance, I had two dueling PKMs, right? Taliban here, a and opening up here, right? And it was so loud that there was no, you couldn't hear your team, right? All you could see would be the Sark, you know, the, the reconnaissance corpsman motioning to you to get up on the road and, and drag somebody off the road. 
you've got to push through and you've got to prepare. You've got to understand that your body's going to react different. But what, what I will say is if you trust in your training and you observe some basic tenets of, of combat, 360 degree security, overwhelming firepower, right? Get off the X. Yeah. You know, the undoctrinal terms of return fire, take cover, return accurate fire. Uh, Sam K, suppress, assess, move, kill. Even as an enabler, you could be on a truck and that can still apply. Like overwhelming immediate application of violence is the only way to win that small portion and just keep that in mind and you will be fine. Yeah, it, it's funny. You just had something make a memory rush back to me too, which is how loud, how loud everything is. And back when, when I was in, we didn't have Peltors. We didn't have those kind of things. It was you put the little foamy earplugs in or you didn't, right? So you wore them on the range, right? You wore them when you were out doing range, stuff like that. But then when you're actually in a tactical environment, you're not wearing those things because you're trying to communicate with people and you just don't think about putting them in, right? And then all of a sudden, back then, an M60 or a saw would open up next to you and it was wincingly painful mm -hmm. from, from just a hearing perspective. Something else I just remember not being prepared for was just the noise, the, the how freaking loud everything was because right. I always had earplugs in on the range before and I didn't when I was there and I was like, geez, I'm never making this mistake again. Yeah. But same thing happened to me. Yeah. Same thing happened to me. And mm -hmm. you know, one of the ANA shot an RPG off like right past my face. You know, I was right in front of him and he's like dancing up and down like RPG, RPG. Yeah. I'm like, no, boom, fires it right past my face. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you have to, you have to deal with it and overcome, but you know, the, the leadership lesson out of, out of, you know, engagements, right. Or even, you know, responding to indirect fire, responding, you know, to IED strikes, whatever it is, training matters. Training will kick in. Mm -hmm. You will execute if you have a base and if you have a foundation and the basics and so all there is to it. Like, and those basic skills can be trained during PT. They can be trained during a little roundtable discussion about a uh, historical engagement. They can be trained during a tactical decision game right all that stuff matters i mean you never know what's going to happen the the individual that was hit on january 28th in afghanistan you know i'm a staff sergeant at that time that was the master sergeant that was the 20 year 0321 jtac most experienced person in the company arguably wounded right in front of us like what are you going to do what are you going to do like and you're in ranger files spread out like 250 meters you've got a partner in force with you well, time to time to get after it, staff sergeant, you know? Yeah. Training matters. Training matters. Brilliance in the basics. It's a saying that we all use, but it's it, we all use it because it's just so grounded in reality. Right. That you really do, ref, you know, rely back on the train. Just the, I'll call it instinct, right? Training builds instinct. There's something else I was saying the other day to somebody. I need to say it more, which is, you know, that saying you train like you fight. Mm-hmm. I actually think it's it's wrong and we should purge it from our military lexicon. It's not it's not train like you fight. It's you're going to fight like you train. Right. Or I like to I like to say train for the fight, right? Like Right, exactly. To me train for the fight is I'm not going to sit here and tell you that we can simulate combat conditions. I can't simulate combat conditions for you on a Tuesday morning on Camp Hansen, Okinawa because I don't have 180 rounds of green tip to put in your gear, right? Right. If I can tell you that Thursday every week is my PT, Gunny's PT, right? Maintenance Chief PT. And we're going to PT in some type of combat load, whether it be plate carrier, helmet, whether it be, you know, LBV, or maybe just boots and use, right? We are training for the fight because we are conditioning our body towards the conditions we may see, right? Right. The thing about it is after this many years, I can tell you right now, I overtrained. Leadership lesson here, right? I overtrained my body when it came to ruck running and running with play carrier and all that. Okay. My knees and my lower back are really bad at this point. And I would suggest that most young leaders only do that type of like really heavy load running, maybe like four times, 
yeah, or maybe maybe like two times a month, really. I mean, I'm not saying don't PT and boost and use, don't PT with your play carrier, but I'm talking like mm-hmm. above 45 pound load running. Like I, I'm pretty screwed up from it, but you've got to do it. You've got to simulate that load because I will tell you as a, you know, mechanic, enabler, record operator, whatever, doing the things that we are supposed to do in combat conditions with full kit on is not easy. I'm, yeah. I'm not saying that you need to be jacked and tan. I'm not saying you need to go to the gym to have big biceps or just do like leg extensions and put it on Instagram. No, what I'm talking about is you need to be a strong person who is able to carry your load and perform your job with that load on without taking any of it off. You need to be mm-hmm. able to, you and probably a buddy in full kit need to be able to change out an MTV tar, right? Or break the torque on the, on a tie rod end or, rig for tow, right? And that's specific to motor T, I got it, but it can be applied across the, you know, the majority of our our MOSs that are resident in at least in an infantry battalion, right? Right. You need to be a capable, strong person regardless of gender, age, experience. Can we talk about physical fitness in the Marine Corps for a few minutes? Sure. From from a leadership perspective because you're still in I'm out. Right. So for people who are listening, like I'm 55 years old. Okay. I'm not a pig. I'm in okay shape. I exercise, but it's more for like health than it is really appearances and things like that. And and I'm certainly maintaining functional fitness for a healthy lifestyle more so than my ability to go out and put on 40 pounds of kit and carry somebody, a wounded Marine in combat. Right. So my perspective on, on fitness is different. But my perspective on fitness now is directly attributable to what my perspective was on fitness when I was in. And so when I, when I was on active duty, we didn't have the, the CFT yet, which I actually think is a fantastic addition to the, to the fitness program of the Marine Corps. And I actually think it, in my mind, it's probably more important and uh, indicative of somebody's functional fitness than say the physical fitness test. So I knew people, lieutenants and officers, who could put on their running shoes and their silkies and go out and run a sub 18 minute three mile. And I don't think that just because they could do a 300 PFT, which back then was the sit ups, the kipping pull up in a, in a sub 18 minute three mile run. And I look at this and I think, you know, is there a change in perspective that needs to take place from a leadership perspective? where we start to actually evaluate somebody's physical fitness levels from the perspective of like, this is a person who could do their job in combat under stress with all of their gear on versus what does an 18 minute, three mile really tell us about somebody's physical conditioning? If you're somebody who is training to go to a selection or you're training to go to one of the various uh, infantry progression schools, I got it. You know, there, there's a time Mm -hmm. and place for that. And, and if, if, if it's something that you want to do once in a while on your own over distance, uh, I understand that because every single unit that I've been in in my career, except for MARSOC, has done conditioning hikes. In MARSOC, rock running, the ability to do so was just expected. Every unit I've been in, Marine Corps, you know, Marine Air Wing, the MIG, Division, MLG, and then obviously I was a combat instructor. Everybody hiked. So being able to maintain the ability to conduct a force march as a leader is important because you don't want to be the one falling out of the hike, right? Right. But fitness in the Marine Corps right now, first thing that needs to be recognized is the Marine Corps has standards. Now, a third class PFT, is that making standard? Yes, that is making standard. I will never tell a Marine that they our shithead or berate them or whatever, because they ran a third class PFT. The Marine Corps has established that standard that is signed off by senior leaders and accepted as an appropriate level of fitness to serve in the Marine Corps. Mm -hmm. What I will tell that Marine is two things. A, go look inside your profile in the junior enlisted performance evaluation system and see how, how that PFT score stacks up against your MOS and the combined rest of the Marine Corps. That's for your progression in your career, bud. Second, I'm going to tell you a story. I'm going to tell you a story from my career where being in shape mattered, right? 
then it's on the individual. The individual, because you can do unit PET all day. You can go up and down the microwave in Horno. You can go up Engineer Hill on Mainside Pelt. You can do the tank trails and, you know, Lejeune or, or the, the sugar cookie right there in Twin Palms. Some people, some young Marines are going to go back to the barracks. They're going to order Domino's and they're going to play Xbox. And they're not going to improve themselves. Hopefully, your leadership perspective on fitness combined with their ranking, for better, lack of better terms, within the system will encourage them to get in better shape. What I would say right now, by my observation, the Marine Corps is probably in the best and worst shape it's ever been in. We have a force fitness community in the Marine Corps. I think it's called the Marine Corps. It's like called human performance or something now. Anyway, but we have force fitness instructors in the Marine Corps now. We have hit lockers, high intensity tactical training lockers all over the place, phenomenal hit centers. There is more opportunity for Marines to be in shape right now than ever before. However, there's more accessibility to, you know, Xboxes and flat screen TVs and, and poor uh, health. I mean, if you go to the food court on Camp Hansen, as of last year when I left, there was a pizza place, uh, like a fried chicken place, a sub place. And a subway. So it was like two different ones, right? Mm -hmm. None of that I would, I believe is super healthy, right? And, you know, the different pots of money stuff will come up, blah, blah, blah. Like, I don't want to hear it. If the Marine Corps is really serious about being in shape, we need to get these unhealthy options out of our, uh, off our installations, right? You know, our Burger Kings, our McDonald's, our, our whatever, right? But on the other hand, going back to the in shape, one perfect example of fitness is uh, listening to a podcast uh, with Travis Haley. It's called The Bridge Podcast last week. One of the Marines that was wounded in Afghanistan last year was on that podcast. He's a, a double or triple amputee. When he was blown up, he was like 215, you know, war fighter, right? War fighter in shape. If he had not had the muscle mass he had, he would have died, according to the doctors. So that fitness does matter. It's hard to get some people motivated for fitness when they when they were they lived the life they were raised out of shape. You know, when I was a combat instructor, I would probably tell you that sixty percent of the young the young men coming into the Marine Corps and, and Marine Combat Training Battalion were were out of shape. Honestly, you got to fight against an entire lifestyle, and hopefully your your stories and their drive to get promoted will help them out. Okay, if people can do whatever they want to in their own time. That's just my philosophy, right? So, but but when you're, it's duty hours and you're a leader and you're in charge and you can run PT, what are some of the things that leaders should be doing from a PT perspective to get people into the best shape that they can be in to perform their functions? What, from your experience, can you communicate to senior leaders or even junior leaders to say, here are some of my experiences with functional fitness in the military, and here's what I think you should be doing as a leader during the working hours to get the the Xbox pizza eater, at least in the best shape that you can get them in on duty hours? Well, for rucking, you know, one of the first things I ever heard Major Tom Schumann say when I was a student under him was rucking is the most basic form of military movement. It's historical. I'm not saying that the 20 mile McCree, you know, full kit, you know, applies to every single Marine, but it's like marksmanship, right? It's a tenant of military ground, military service, right? You know, being able to engage with your weapon, being able to move under a load, you know, being able to take care of your buddy. I don't believe that force marching needs to be, I mean, there's standards for it already, right? You know, the, the Marine Corps has right, standards, sure. and mm -hmm. I think we should abide to the standards we have. You have to reach way back in the MARA, I mean, I can't reference it, but it is broken down by load-bearing units, quote, and non-load-bearing units. There's weight, there's time, there's distance associated with it. If we would just observe those standards, just like everything else I always say, be within regulations, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Do I think that conducting a force march as a conditioning, there's no way that you're going to condition yourself for that 20-miler or whatever it is for McCree if you're only relying on the battalion hikes or company hikes leading up to that. It's not going to happen. You do need to move 
under a load on your own time or by my observation, and I'm not a fitness expert, Dave, like I, I'm, yeah, I'm not, I'm certainly you know, not one, but by yeah. my observation, the best runners, you know, and I ran like seven cycles at combat instructor school, right. As the chief, some of the best runners were the ones who wouldn't break down during those uh, 20 K hikes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We'd have some of the bigger guys that would perform very well in the, you know, the five, the 10 and the 15 K, but many of them would start breaking down at the very end because they didn't have the, I guess the cardiovascular endurance, right. Respiratory endurance and all that kind of stuff. So being a good runner will help, you know, but you know, hiking, I'm telling you like that, that stuff is always going to be a big argument. Trust me. I mean, there's an argument. You'll have that argument in the wing. Like, why are we even doing this at all? Like, I got it. I, I, you have a good argument, but here's the deal. Leadership, leadership lesson that I learned from, I knew it, but I, I made sure the Marines learned from third battalion, fifth Marines, right? Being in proximity of three, five. When I was with MWCS 38, Marine Wing Communications Squadron 38 out of Miramar as a staff sergeant, this is post MARSOC time, the squadron commander, Lieutenant Colonel Dom Ford, now a full bird. He looked at myself and uh, now retired uh, Colonel, Lieutenant Colonel Sean Carano, who would have been a major back then, and said, gentlemen, we've got 120,000 rounds of green tip. We've got some grenades. We've got some nine millimeter. I want to train this squadron. You guys design it and make it happen, right? We go up to Camp Pendleton. We're staged. We're doing dry, dry drills, and uh, we're prepping our gear for the ranges the next day and the rappel tower. And up on the hill, good old 3-5 squad leaders were PT and their Marines, right? So they're in the back, PT and with their Marines. And uh, some of my radio operators were like, they're like, Staff Sergeant, who's that? And I'm like, that's 3rd Battalion, 5th Marines. They're just squad leaders training their Marines, getting after it. I'm like, you could go there next. That's why all this conditioning matters. You're an 0621 field radio operator. You could go there next. You could go to reconnaissance battalion. You could go to insert unit that has a load bearing uh, requirement, and you could go there next. That is why it's important for leaders, no matter what unit they're in, if they are in an MOS that can go anywhere, admin, supply, comm, motor transport, NBC, intelligence, embarkation. Like, you know, we can go down the list, right? Be in shape because you don't know where you're going next. Com Marines are like the first sergeants. You go anywhere. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yes. You can go anywhere. If you look back, what, what do you think was one of the best lessons that you were taught by your worst leader? The worst leaders weren't present. That's what it comes down to. People, mm-hmm. they're the ones who think that they have the, they rate something like, oh, rank as privilege or, you know, that, that you know, uh, I'm out doing staff sergeant things or I'm doing gunny things, blah, blah, blah. Like young men in particular do not want to follow a non-present leader. That's all there's to it. Like our young men and women, but mostly men are in like the final, you know, cognitive development stages of their life, right? They, are, they mm-hmm. joined because they want to serve. They didn't join the Marine Corps because they want to be lazy. They may have fallen into that because of they weren't given a good example, right? They weren't in proximity of good leaders. They weren't under good leaders. They weren't, or weren't in proximity of good peers, right? But the non-present leaders were the ones who set an example to show me how not to be, right? So I've, I've tried at least to be that present guy, you know? You just mentioned something about the the not being present, and I think a lot of that comes back to you mentioned it before entitlement, sense of entitlement. And you know, and you know what just flashed through my mind. I'm gonna just paint a picture for you and then get your reaction on this. But I was recently out in Twenty Nine Palms for a Marine Corps birthday, which I've explained on a different episodes. It, it was a weird time of the year, but a uh, unit was de- getting ready to deploy, and they wanted to have a Marine Corps birthday, so I went out there. And my uncle, who is a career Amtrak Marine, had passed away in the spring of 2021. He started out his career as, you know, in Vietnam. So it didn't matter what your MOS was, right? (laughs) 
you were you were no three oh two. And uh he was with one five and three five in nineteen sixty six. So he cut his teeth as a lieutenant and, and he was a pretty he was a pretty tough exacting officer. He was one of those stereotypical if you think back to not that this is a great movie, but Heartbreak Ridge, right? You know, you think back to the eighties type of officer, he was one of those really like wearing the Al Gray Marine, you know, utility uniform. You just, right. I close my eyes and I see him like that. It was a hell, he was a fantastic man, a great leader. So my family spread his ashes at the bottom of the AAV battalion ramp in Camp Pendleton because he was, you know, his career ramp tracker and that was his favorite command. And so as I was driving through the the third AAV battalion area and, and Amtrak school and everything to visit him, I, I, I saw all of these parking spots and each one is reserved for like some billet and there's like 80 of them, right? Assistant maintenance chief, uh, you know, assistant, you know, volleyball person, like all these assigned parking spots on the concrete header of a parking, you know what I'm talking about? Like the the little concrete thing that kind of goes in there. And I'm thinking to myself, how entitled, and I'm not picking on that unit because they're all like this, right? How entitled are these people to where they feel like they rate a parking spot and just the entitlement generation in the military about like, I'm this billet, I'm this rank. So I rate this and I'm, I'm picking on the parking spots because I just happen to notice it. I'm thinking to myself, what would happen if you took away every single parking spot, except for the people who literally had to come and go on a daily basis, three or four times a day, like think the operations officer or the, the sergeant major, anybody like, Hey, you got to come up to regiment. You got to go over to main side. You got to do this. And they need a parking spot because when they get back, they need to, you know, efficiently get in and out of units because they're essentially commuting between different places and took all those parking spots away from everybody. Like what sort of signal would that send about entitlement? I'm not suggesting units do that. I'm just asking just to get a reaction from you on that. Cause you've probably seen all these parking spots I'm talking about. The parking spots are, uh, are always like this heated point of contention. Like, I think that really, I mean, a lot of the camps and you know, around there, they just don't have a lot of parking, right? Part of it's that. And like people think, you know, people, my, my job, my billet is, you know, more important than yours, you know, whatever. I think that, I think that everybody might time manage a little bit better if they uh, knew that they had to come be for parking every morning, you know, just leave, leave a spot for the Sergeant Major Master Guns. XO and uh, and battalion commander and then let everybody else fight over it. I think our time management might get a little bit better. You reminded me uh, of something I really wanted to talk about. And, uh, you know, you talk about entitlement. When the word entitlement comes up, we always think about uh, the junior Marines, right? Oh, this generation, that generation, blah, blah, blah. Like, I don't want to hear it, right? Like, I don't want to hear it about generational divides because, like, you know, millennials took out Fallujah and Marja. So let's just start there, right? You want to complain about generations, it's whatever. You know, you read any of the old Marine Corps stuff, the NCOs in World War II were complaining about the the young Marines that had joined post December 7th, you know, post Pearl Harbor. So it's like, that's always going to happen. The entitlement that I have an issue with is senior leaders who feel entitled to not have to train. All right. Now, this isn't just me making this up. When I went to the uh, E8 seminar, Camp Pendleton. Nope, sorry. I went in uh, Okinawa. One of the first things that the sergeant major, the MEF sergeant major, his last name was either Wood or Woods. I can't remember. He asked us why we weren't going to the field. A whole room of E8s. He's like, hey, y'all, why aren't y'all going to the field? And I'm like, ooh, here we go. This is going to be spicy. Like, I like this, right? I had, like, literally mm-hmm. been on the range of my Marines, like, the day prior, right? He's like, do we, we don't feel like we need to train, right? You're like, what, what's going on? He's like, I, he's like, I've been, you know, around the area and everyone can say like, oh, we've got too much to do on GCSS Marine Corps or the ops chief doesn't need to be out there, blah, 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 blah. Here's what I'll tell you. Your prior experience, you know, your combat action ribbon, your bronze star, your campaign medals, blah, 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 blah. Those don't by default prepare you for the next one. They don't, right? And the next one is going to be a bit different than this one or could be everybody needs to start training right on first of all as a leader it sets the example to be out there with your marines right second of all we are going to experience things and if we have this conflict that we are trying to change the marine corps to compete in we are going to see things that we did not see in gwat Mm -hmm. uas you know unmanned aerial systems counter reconnaissance signature management basics of camouflage, right? 
enemy recognition, near far recognition, logistics and C2 nodes being targeted. All this stuff is happening right now in Ukraine. It's happening in the Azerbaijan and Armenia conflicts. We are going to see that stuff. Just because you got in a tick in 2005 doesn't mean that you don't have to train, right? When I checked into my first place as a first sergeant, right? I was briefly in a, a company that got dissolved within about four weeks of me getting there. I moved over to Alpha Company, third law enforcement battalion. This is field MPs, right? Infantry structure, fire team squad, platoon, company gunny, XO, CO me. Staff Sergeant Andrew Calco, dog handler, purple heart recipient, very experienced MP, walks in my office. He's like, you know, everyone's kind of apprehensive around the new first sergeant, right? They don't know who you are. And some of my peers have set a precedent, you know, for people to take caution when they're around the new first arm. So Staff Sergeant Calco goes, first sergeant, um, we're we're shooting this week. Uh, would you would you like to come to the range with us? And I like stop what I'm doing. I'm like, Staff Sergeant, the answer to that question will always be yes. You will always allocate ammunition for me, and I will always train with the Marines, right? And he's like, looks at me. I'm like. And make sure the convoy brief is freaking squared away, right? You know, because so, I'm, you know, I'm still going to leverage some of my old abilities. So I go out there, we shoot combat pistol program qualification. So before we, and I'm a good enough of a shot with a pistol where I can talk some shit, right? Okay. Because there's, you want to challenge Marines, right? You want to, right. you want to breed some competition. And that's the individual type of competition that I like, right? You can't, you're the one pulling the trigger. You're the one. It's your sight picture, right? So I go ahead in front of all the Marines, and I'm like, only one of you is going to beat me today. Only one of you is going to outshoot me. This is the first day they met their first arm, right? You know, maybe a little competent, cocky, whatever. But I know it's going to create some competition. You know, we, we, we start shooting typical Okinawa range. It starts raining, right? You know, Marines are getting dirty, you know, filthy, wet. You know, I don't have a skeevy shirt on under my camis. Like, oh, my God, right? Marines are, you know, half in boonies and half in eight point covers. Oh my God. No, you know, what, you know, things that would make some people like just cringe. Right. But you know, what is straight on these Marines. Like their kit, their gun belts are straight, like a couple of refinements, but they're, they're, they're presenting the pistol the right way. They're, 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 they're engaging properly. They're taking the, the, the weapon system seriously. We get done and everyone's just filthy. Right. I was like, I got to mess with them. I stole this from uh, Tim Williams, Silver Star recipient, uh, recon first sergeant. I go, I'm like, you all look disgusting right now. You're dirty. You're filthy. Half of you don't have skeevy shirts on. There's no uniformity with our covers, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> I'm, like, <"Are> you all <laughs> I'm like, are you all professionals right now? I'm like yelling at them, right? Right on the range. And like nobody said anything, including the skipper, which I will talk about him soon. And I'm like, you're damn right. You're professional right now. You are in a profession of arms. We deal with conditions. We engage our targets. We qualify. You're damn right. You're professional. And don't let anyone forget it. There's a time and place to look trim and proper. I wouldn't expect you to go to the Camp Hanson PX looking like that. But take the five minutes when you get back to fix yourself and get ready to serve back in that little contaminant area garrison environment, right? Right. And I took a I, – I had a – white and black subdued IR American flag patch on my admin pouch that I'd had there for since Afghanistan. Right. And I told, I'm like, all right, you know, Sergeant Richard, he was the only one that beat me, beat me by two points. Right. And I called him up. Yeah. I ripped it off my, ripped it off my admin pouch and I gave it to him. I was like, I've had this for over a decade war in combat. Good job. You're the only one that outshot me today. Right. That's day one as a first arm. I think I made, I think I had some leadership capital there. Right. You know, you know gained a little bit, yeah. of, gained a little bit of an edge. Isn't that amazing how just the little things can make a huge difference in leadership? Yes. Yeah. Just the little things like giving the guy the – giving the sergeant that that little flag that was important to you and communicating to him how important it was to you. I'll bet he still has that thing. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 you know, and I know that it was important to that company, that, that company to have an engaged leader. And, and let me tell you one thing about 3rd Law Enforcement Battalion. Third Law Enforcement Battalion does not exist anymore because it went away with Force Design 2030's reshuffle of the Marine Corps, right? Right. So I'm checking in to a battalion that still has 18 months until they dissolve, but they've already been told they are going away. Quote, LE Battalions, this capacity is in excess to our current needs. 
which can be met by the remaining force with some adjustments in current operational practice. So I'm showing up to a unit of 5811 MPs who are told that their job can be done by somebody else. They're going away. Trust me when I say when I got to that battalion, there was a, oh, we're, we're going away. We're going away mentality. They still had 18 months. I got there about the same time that Lieutenant Colonel Bryce Carter showed up. What battalion commander wants to show up and have an 18-month time in command when all his only goal is to roll up the flag? He would say, he's, he would say, we're the only maneuver element besides reconnaissance, right? You know, who is organic to this island, right? Because the infantry battalions are on UDP or the MU, right? We have Humvees. We have 50 cals, Mark 19s. We have M249s still, by the way, M240s. We have M110 sniper rifles. We have Marines who are ready to train, Marines who are ready to deploy. Obviously, I'm not going to go into a place and have the mentality that we're not going to train or we're just going to go away because all that's going to turn into is a bunch of Marines in the room playing Xbox, drinking too much alcohol, doing dumb stuff, right? So insert the company commander. Now, Major Thomas Fiametta. So skipper, Captain Fiametta at the time. He walks in the second day after that range and he goes, first sergeant, you're a little different, huh? <laughs> And I'm like, sir, the number one thing we do in the Marine Corps is train Marines for combat, train and prepare Marines for combat while taking care of them and their families, right? That is, that is what we do. And I'm like, we have about 18 months until this battalion is going to roll up the flag and be, be disbanded. I'm like, you never know, right? And he's like, I completely agree with you, you know? Dave, there's a reason why I have not done an Instagram post about command relationships yet. Because I don't know how I am going to properly sum up in words or slides or memes my relationship with Tom Fiametta. It was absolutely perfect. You know, I, I mentioned I got there and I was under real quick for about five weeks. I was under Mark Moran, major now. Him and I had a good relationship, but he got rolled up to go under the COVID cell, unfortunately. So my, my first skipper was short-lived. But with Tom Fiametta, this is like, this is a like 255 pound, probably 6'3", you know, athlete that was raised by a retired infantry lieutenant colonel, attended the, the Valley Forge Preparatory School for high school, went to NAPS, graduated the Naval Academy. This guy was born to, you know, lead, right? Or at least men, I don't really think, I don't think people are born leaders, but he was mentored his whole life to, to lead, right? Big guy, been around, he'd been a company commander at MCRD Paris Island. He, you know, he'd been on a, like a liaison deployment to uh, the Georgia area. He'd been around. The first thing that would always come out of his mouth to me would be, hey, Top, uh, what are your thoughts on this? Even if the skipper was probably 99% decided on something, he would still walk into any of the leadership's office and ask them their thoughts on the thing before the conversation started. Present the issue, ask the thoughts on it. He would do that with the, the lieutenants. He would do it with the staff. He would do it with the squad leaders, right? Hey, what are your thoughts on this? And he would listen. He, would, he would really would listen. He and I... It immediately, immediately had this phenomenal command relationship because we were on the same page, right? I don't necessarily believe in like officer stuff and enlisted stuff, right? Like if you're a command team, you need to be on the same page. Like you can't, and this goes all the way down to, you know, platoon commander, platoon sergeant. But if you're a platoon sergeant, you know, staff sergeants out there, listen up. You're not the one that is overall answering for the thing. That's the the lieutenant, right? That goes all the way up to the the company battalion, you know, officers, officers get paid well for a few specific things, right? They command, they issue the eventual orders, right? And they own things like the CMR, right? The property book. Uh, and I'm sure, you know, th that's from my perspective, right? Kappa Fiametta and I, you know, we just immediately had this mentality together that no, we do not care that this battalion is going away. We will be a prepared unit under the mission essential tasks that we have. So what does that look like for MPs, right? Like 
we would practice like uh, holding security on a voting center, right? Or holding security on like a Shura or something like that, right? Convoy operations, all the different weapon systems. You know, it was, it was it was cool to be still be shooting M249s. Like the infantry hasn't had the saw in like ten years. We're still rocking a saw with a SDO optic with an RMR. Like, and what do you know? Boom, we get called up for an actual mission. We get called up for an actual mission like three months in, right? And by this time, I've got a pretty good I've got a pretty good relationship with the Marines too. We got called to Guam. The 36th Air Wing out there needed additional security. Because they had brought in, and this is this is published, so I can talk about it. They had brought in F twenty two Raptors to like, you know, show some force to China. But they needed more security, so we get there, and like the Air Force, I love the Air Force. Like we get there, and they're like, "Ah, oh, sorry, the best building we have for you is the old officer housing. We we converted all the houses into individual hotel rooms or hotel houses, so." That's the best we can do for you. It's only half per diem. It's only thirty nine dollars a day, not the seventy two out in town that it would be at a hotel. We're like, I'm like, you should see how my Marines live in Camp Hansen in that barracks. Like this yeah. is phenomenal. So, <laughs> yeah, every Marine got their own. Well, every two Marines got their own house. So for two months, I stayed in a house with the skipper, and we just worked out. You know, we did PME. We made PMEs for the Marines, uh, you know, force design PMEs, educating the Marines. He was he was going through, I think, command and staff at the time. So it was great to hear like that information coming out of uh, what he was what he was doing. And we worked with the Air Force and we assigned our Marines to both like the airfield security mission, the on base security mission and the jungle engagement mission. Right. So in Guam for Anderson Air Force Base, they have a poaching threat right on base and they also have essentially paid informant threat, you know, observer threat from, you know, who, right. People are getting paid by, you know, who across the ocean there to spy on the base. So our Marines were in the jungle tracking down like poachers and, and paid informants with their dogs, full ammo, full kit, full ammo, nods, everything. Like I'm literally out in the rain chasing after a dude in 2020 with, you know, peck on, nods down, running across the jungle floor in Guam, trying to chase dudes down, like getting spiders in my face and all that. Like my yeah. Marines caught some guys too. They caught some guys straight up. But that was a good experience because when you work with a different service, especially if you're a Marine, you want to walk into that service and you want to, you want to provide them something, right? You want to provide right. them something other than what they asked, right? So I told the, the two senior master sergeants, so E8s, right? I was like, hey, uh, I've been teaching marksmanship for, for years. Would you guys like some instruction? Your security forces airmen? And they're like, yeah, of course. We took these airmen and we had them hitting 500 meter yard, actually 500 yard reduced size steel silhouettes in like one day. That's it, awesome. It was awesome. Every, I mean, it was, we did so much training with them. We did, we did sim round training, CQB, like take advantage of the time you have, right? Like, because you're going to get a different perspective from uh, a different branch of service, right? Well, and vice versa, too. I mean, if you're ever around other sister services, they can provide you with yeah. training that you never even thought of before. Yeah. But yeah, going back to the skipper, like you're talking about a guy at the time, he had four kids. You know, they've got a fifth one now. And he was just able to maintain a calm demeanor, right? He was analytical with uh, his decision making process, he cared. Like watching, I would write, consider myself a decent writer, right? I would write a CIRCOM or a Navy Achievement Medal summary of action or citation summary of action. I'd be like, I did a good job. And, it, you know, and the skipper, he would take, he, he, he would say that awards are an emotional event for him, right? Awards were an emotional event for him because he took them that seriously. I mean, he'd take like 30 minutes just to review a, a, a CIRCOM because he was analyzing every line and comparing it to the actions that that young Marine did. I thought that was pretty important. So we just had this absolutely perfect relationship and, you know, you know, command teams PT, PT together, right. You know, out there, you know, trying to maintain the same tire flip workout with a, with a guy who's an athlete at two fifty five and six, three is that can be a challenge. Right. But yeah, I, 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 you know, definitely had to challenge myself, but it was, it was good. And then we went to Korea afterwards. We went to KMEP and worked with the rock Marines. I did the same thing. 
It's like, hey, you guys want to learn? We'll learn from you. It's phenomenal. And it was in January, February of 2021. COVID and the the uh, brutal uh, temperatures. Leadership lesson there, you know, don't let the weather make you a victim, right? Because everyone's watching yeah. you. You know, the, the rock Marines are watching you. Your Marines are watch, watching you. Yeah, it was good. Uh, I, I mean, I can't even begin. I, I mean, if everybody could have the command relationship like Tom Fiametta and I had at the company level, I mean, the Marine Corps would, 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 would benefit from it. I'm telling you right now, a good command relationship set. I'm not saying it's responsible for the command climate because the people subordinate to you still do have their own free will, right? There are, people can do dumb stuff. They can have their own attitude. But what I'm saying is demonstrating and showcasing a phenomenal command relationship has an effect on the subordinate command relationships, right? The XO, the company gunny, the platoon commanders, the platoon sergeants, right? And down to the Lance Corporal and the PFC, they see a positive example of, you know, just two leaders interacting with each other, right? You know, who, you know, the first two to go down the rappel tower was a skipper and I, and I'll say right now, I don't like heights like that. I don't. Mm-hmm. It's not something I'm, it's not something I'm, 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 I'm stoked on. And first two to go down the rappel tower that came up was, uh, was the skipper and I set the example, right? Yeah. That's awesome demonstrate, right? I'm going to demonstrate live fire, right? Just like I would expect a McMath instructor to actually fight his students, right? Like demonstrate skills, proficiency as a leader, you will get the buy-in from the young Marines, from the young troops. So shifting gears a little bit, I'm kind of curious about your opinion on things like evaluations, promotions, and awards. Sure. Do you think a system that relies on the opinions of your boss and their boss is, is, is a really effective way to do things like evaluations, promotions, and awards? So, you know, it's interesting. Whenever one of the topic of evaluations comes up, you know, sometimes we tend to look at the, you know, the Air Force and the Army model uh, or the Navy model, right? I guess as I've gone along and, and served and, you know, I have friends that are, are senior enlisted in other services or like when I was deployed to Guam, I sat down with the uh, Air Force First Sergeant uh, for a while and talked about it. They all love our evaluation criteria. They they think that what we are doing is a superior model to theirs. I mean, yes, it's subjective to that leader's opinion, but you know, the Marine Corps has a really good track record of trusting their commanders, right? And and I have seen this with I mean, recently I saw a situation that I I won't talk about on this uh platform, but of the, the Marine Corps really trusting commander's recommendations, right? I do believe that 99.9% of the officers that I've served under had uh, level heads and were, and were keeping the best interests of their Marines in mind while going through the fitness report process and writing. The issue with the fitness reports is they don't have enough latitude on how they can write. They don't. They don't have enough latitude on the grading criteria, right? Across, you know, B through F or whatever G, that grading criteria, they literally can't put negative stuff in there unless it's a directed comment, which means you're automatically, pretty much automatically ruining that Marine's chances on that next board, right? We're an institution that talks about a couple of things. We talk about zero defect mentality, but one finisher board can ruin your chances for promotion, right? You've got to get away from that. You know, we also talk about decentralized command, but we've also completely centralized the enlisted and officer placement process across the world, right? One monitor controls everyone's, you know, everyone's future, you know, which talent management has talked about fixing that or tweaking that, not that it's broken, but on evaluations, one thing that I'm happy to see is a junior enlisted performance evaluation system. Now, the module itself seems to, it needs some additions to make JPEZ a little easier to manipulate by the end user, the end user leader, so really like corporal and above, right? However, the fact that a Marine, you know, a private through Lance Corporal, well, I guess you don't get a JPS score till you're a Lance Corporal, but can log into their profile and see how they stack up immediately against their peer in grade and MOS, and then all their peers in grade across the whole Marine Corps. That's a good thing. So real quick pause though. So just for people who are listening, who are of some different generations, 
like pro cons, the new JPEZ, can can you do a quick orientation there? Okay. Legacy pro cons was just that system we elected inside Marine Online or on paper for some people, you know, your age back in the day. That mm-hmm. was the uh, a portion of the IRAM, right? The individual records administrative manual. That's gone. So the 4.5, you know, average 4.5, average, that, that's gone. All right. Right. The junior enlisted performance evaluation system is its own order now. Marines are now judged off of individual character, MOS proficiency, and their warfighting ability, right? So I'm, I'm missing one. This is killing me right now. McMap belt, rifle range, PFT, CFT, off duty education, if they have it, that all goes in. Those are tangible things that go in to make a, a portion of their score, right? All right? Leadership, character, and MOS proficiency, right? Those three things are the intangibles that the leadership judges them on, right? Those feed into the score, right? Zero right. to 5.0, you know, so 0.1 to 5.0, right? Zero, you know, if you are a 0.9 to a zero grade by your leadership, that needs to be justified via 6105 counseling, maybe they had an NJP, something like that. If you're a 4.0 to a 5.0, Maybe it's 4.1 to 5.0. That has to be justified as well and signed off by a battalion commander, right? Maybe they got a NAM. Maybe they want NCO the quarter. Maybe they, et cetera, et cetera, right? It gives more latitude, right? So now you can really break your Marines apart. An average Marine is a 2.5 across the board, right? 2.5, 2.5, 2.5, and then add in all their rifle range, pistol or rifle range, right. McMap, et cetera. A high performing Marine typically is going to be like a 4.3, 4.5 out of five, right? You justified that battalion commander signed off on it. Now you've got a huge way to break yourself out, break the Marines out other than before, where if they had below a 4.0 on pro cons, you had to justify it. You only had from 4.0 to 5.0 for your Marines who weren't in trouble, right? So it's just a better platform but I believe the best part about it is it, it shows the Marines where they stand. And that hopefully, I mean, that first of all, that educates them, which is important. And it, it should prompt, encourage a little bit of competition, or at least individual competition, the type that I like, right? Right. So JPEZ is good, okay? I asked, this, and, and I asked the question to the Commandant of the Marine Corps, it would have been in like January of 2020 timeframe. So just prior to COVID exploding, blah, 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 blah. I said, hey, sir, you know, and Sergeant Major Black is there. Mm-hmm. And this is in front of like 3,000 people in the Camp Schwab Base Theater. I'm like, sir, I've been, a, I've been a staff and CO for 10 years now. And every enlisted PME that I've been to has not only suggested, but charged me, right, with the responsibility of developing junior officers, right? And remember, some might not want to admit it, but that does extend to warrant officers, right? Some warrant officers, you know, they've got eight years and nine years and they're still developing too, okay? It's not just lieutenants. Why am I not evaluated on my ability to develop junior officers if every single PME I've been to, every book I read about Vietnam, right? Every, every single official thing I read tells me that it is the platoon sergeant's job to develop the platoon commander, first sergeant's job, develop CO, company guy's job, XO, et cetera, right? They get to the point where that's not as, you know, the, the relationship always exists, right? Development is at its most important stage through in company level, company grade officer, right? Mm-hmm. I'm not evaluated on my ability to do so. I'm evaluated on my abil- ability to develop and lead subordinates, but there's nothing on there for developing junior officers. And I will tell you, the lieutenants in Okinawa were one of the best parts about my Okinawa experience from 2018 to 2021. Phenomenal, phenomenal young officers that were hungry. They wanted to learn. They they brought something to the table. They were extremely intelligent. Uh, you know, Mark Matiski, Angelo Fercasa, Matt Wheelock, Colin Hogan, right? You're t- like these are and these are young officers. Some of them are prior enlisted, but that just wanted to get after it. And they understood the value of team, you know, being a team, learning from knowledge, collaboration, right? Like one of the uh, sayings that's hot right now is knowledge transfer, but really it's knowledge collaboration. So I 
asked the commandant and he's like, you know, Gunny, you know, we're, we're, we're reevaluating stuff. And then Sergeant Major Black picked up with JPEZ. I would like to see that. I would like to see our staff and COs evaluated on their ability to develop company grade officers. Yeah. I'll even add that they should probably be judging captain's abilities to develop junior officers too. Right. We we're talking about that with either General Furness or General Alfred. We were talking about, you know, captains really don't ever get taught how to lead the officers. And all of a sudden they, they're doing it in company command. Very parallel tracks to the points that you're making there. Mm -hmm. What was the answer that they're just going to, that they're still evaluating things and working on it? So the answer was we're starting with the junior enlisted population. We are, we are okay. going to change. And I, I'm sure that, because that would have been 2020. I'm sure that talent management 2030 was probably an idea, but this was like weeks. This was a couple months before Force Design 2030 came out, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I think General Berger probably had to hold a few things back, right? Sure. Because he knew that the working groups were happening about talent management, because there's a lot of things in talent management 2030 that are like, boom, right? Like blowing, blowing minds, you know, which is a good thing, right? I do believe, based off some of his comments, that the fitness report evaluation criteria as it stands right now is going to change. I do not believe it is solidified yet, but it is going to change, you know, and now whether or not we want to have a, I don't really know about, you know, Lance corporal evaluating a corporal corporal evaluating the sergeant, you know, that's a, that's a slippery slope right there. Right. Cause you can get some serious uh, opinions going either way. There can be a lot of favoritism. I'm not saying there's not merit in it, but it would have to be vetted pretty hard you know, yeah. by senior, you know, more senior leadership, I, I would say. What about the perspective that evaluating doesn't necessarily have to have a formal official format? I mean, can't we be evaluating as leaders all the time informally? I always tell my Marines I'm judging them, right? I'm judging you. I, I really am. Like, I'm always evaluating you. Your young Marines are always evaluating you too, right? I mean, sure. they're, they're always watching, you know, they're watching how you performed. Uh, they're watching how you interact. They'll notice if you drive into work and, and you know, you, you hang around in, in civvies for the first, first half of the morning before putting camis on. Like, I mean, they're, they're always evaluating you. If there wasn't a formal evaluation system, how would we, how would we measure effectiveness to, to progress and, and rank yeah. and, and gain command and be slated for Sergeant Major at 06 Command? And, and you know, I mean, really the, the whole system, I'm not, I'm not sure I have an answer for that. Right. Well, I guess what I was getting at was... I think there's a lot of opportunity for leaders to evaluate, and I like to tack on the word mentor, in, an, in not to replace the formal, but to supplement the formal with informal. So in other words, okay, if you are doing the junior enlisted performance evaluation system, I, I can't, I, I'm not familiar with it enough to know how many, but I'm assuming that happens twice a year, you get that score? It happens Is twice that? a year for active duty, once a year for reserve. Okay. So, so every six months you're getting an official uh, evaluation, but how about every month you sit down with those Marines and give them an unofficial, Hey, here are some things I think you need to work on in order to bring your score up by the, by the time the six month window hits around. And I've got a couple of ideas. So there's the evaluating and the mentoring. I think there's a huge component of leadership that doing that is inherent in, in being a leader and maybe more of that needs to take place. Yeah, you, you should be talking to your Marines. You know, when the Marine Corps like mentorship program was signed off and, and published in 2006, we looked at it. I was a sergeant by then. And I'm like, so this is telling us to write down everything we're doing anyway. What is this? Right. Like it's just mm -hmm. killing trees. It's redundant. We're already, you know, a, a good leader should be doing that. They should be getting out on the shop floor with their troops. They should be PTing. Leaders should be PTing with their troops a few times a month, right? I'm talking staff mm -hmm. and COs, but and if you're an NCO, you better be doing that all the time or your Marines are judging you straight up, right? You know, senior leadership, conducting PMEs, teaching stuff from expectation, right? Like we train through doctrine and we mentor through experience, right? Uh, there's a lot mm -hmm. of value in that, right? And it's like a combination of like, hey, this is what doctrine says, but this is my experience. This is what may happen or could happen, right? Yeah, you need to get out there. You know, and the leaders... I'm not telling anyone they're a bad or a good leader. I'm telling you, if you're not getting out there with your with your troops, you're missing like leadership capital, right? You're missing the gain of leadership capital if you're not out there. They want you there. They do. Some may say they don't, but they want they want a good example because you know. And here's here's how I know that because the second you're not there, they'll use it against you. 
They will. That's what I was going to say. I mean, they <laughs> they may not want you there, but they definitely don't not want you there. Exactly. Yeah, they'll use it against you immediately, yeah. right? Right. So yeah, you got to be you got to be present, and it's just. I mean, this is a profession where we meet a new set of best friends every three years, right? Like we get to, yeah, we get to be with people that we enjoy, right? We have common goals, right? Common backgrounds in many cases, even though we're so diverse, right? This job is great, you know. I mean, I, my retirement's approved. I'm trying to take take advantage of the, uh, as much of it as possible the next, you know, next uh, eleven months or so. But you got to be present. You got to be present as yeah. a leader all the way up, all the way up the chain. Yeah, and I think being present is what will afford a leader an opportunity to actually informally evaluate and mentor people because you certainly can't do it if you're not observing them. So without the observation piece, you can't have the evaluation piece and you can't have the mentorship piece. And and mentoring doesn't necessarily mean that you need to be that person's mentor for life. It just means that you're mentoring through them a situation or an event or an evaluation or something. I mean, mentoring I think sometimes people say like that person's my mentor and it has this connotation of that's a lifelong responsibility or whatever. I mean, I have had people mentor me along the lines in certain, in my civilian world, people have mentored me through business decisions. I mean, here's an example that you can use in the civilian world. My lawyer is not a mentor, but he mentors me through certain decisions I have to take, right? So, right. you know, leaders have an opportunity to be mentors on the spot and in a a truncated moment of time doesn't necessarily mean that you're mentoring somebody for the rest of your life. It certainly could be. Right. But if you have this trust and like you were, you were saying before that the command team, things like that, you end up being, you know, mentoring people through decisions doesn't mean that you're mentoring them on a 30 year career. It just means that you're mentoring them at a, at a certain period of time and leaders inherent in leadership is that responsibility yeah. to do that. Yeah. And, uh, and, and more of that needs to take place. Yeah. And, and you know, Sometimes you end up, you do end up mentoring a young, uh, a younger leader for the fruition of their career, and it's, and you and, and it just based off conversation. Uh, sure, Sergeant Major Roger uh, Griffith, he just retired, thirty years Raider Regiment Sergeant Major, my company first sergeant in Marsoc, you know, and obviously, you know, we we had a rough deployment with a couple of KAs and. You know, he was just the epitome of eighty nine, ninety nine. Like, very. He was he was strict. He was in shape. He was a warfighter, right? Like, and I've I have talked to Sergeant Major Griffith my entire career since, right? You and, and just just pick pick picked his brain, right? It, it's always great to have like, it's great to have that a senior a senior right senior leader who is you probably never serve under again, who you can call and bounce ideas off of, right? Right. And now I'm in that position. My students from MCT. And this is why I always said I didn't have a problem with my young Marines, our young Marines following us on social media, following me on social media, because you never know. I've got MCT students who are getting promoted to staff sergeant now, right? That started last right. year, like, boom, we're crazy, right? I still mentor them and bounce ideas off them all the time, right? Instagram account, the Marine historian, staff sergeant select Nathan Stewart, talk to him all the time. He was, he was one of my very first students at MCT in 2015, right? You have the ability to be a lifelong or career long mentor, and that goes into evaluations. That goes into decision making, right? You bounce, to, you know, decision making questions off people. That goes into you know awards, right? Like writing, right? Awarding, you know. I mean, Sergeant Major Griffith and I sat at his desk in June of 2011, and we edited a posthumous Navy Cross citation, right? That's heavy responsibility, right? Yeah. Something I'll always remember, right? So, I think it's, it's it's important to recognize those people that you maybe you know you may want to stay in contact with because they'll always they'll always be there. I'm telling you, they'll always be there. Yeah, you said something really really early on in the podcast that I've been waiting for the right moment to come back to, and this is a good time to do it because mentorship. I, and I'll also just use, I'm just going to use the term setting the example, right? What I think what people it's not that they choose to fail to recognize this. I just don't think people think about it, but you've got a 20, I'm rounding up. You've got a 20 year career and you're, you're going to be retiring, but there's a PFC in your command somewhere. Mm -hmm. Right. And so next time you have a drill, you're going to make some sort of an impression on a PFC. Right. At, that, that may be remembered as, you know, something good or bad, irrelevant to my point, mm -hmm. you are going to make an impression on a PFC. And it's possible that that PFC could stay in the Marine Corps for over 30 years and 
as a sergeant, become a sergeant major. Yes. So the example that you set or the actions that you are taking or the way you're behaving or, or acting in front of them could have a generational impact on the Marine Corps for the next 30 years. And so when you were talking about the staff and COs who were diddy bopping, remember you were, you were talking about the diddy bopping language early on in the podcast. I wrote that down and I thought to myself, well, geez, if you were coming in, in, I'm, I'm going to use myself as an example because I do the math real quick. I come in in 1990, I get commissioned. So I affiliate with the Marine Corps in 1986 through ROTC. So I'm exposed to Marines starting in 1986. And there's a first sergeant there who's got 20 years in. When did he come in the Marine Corps? Spent right? Vietnam. 1966. Yeah, he was getting it in He's Vietnam. He's in Vietnam. Right. So what is my first impression in the Marine Corps? It's the exposure to this 20-year career. At that point, he was a gunny, right? But And, and I'm, I'm learning from somebody whose formative years were in Vietnam. And what was his first sergeant like? Well, he was probably a Korean War vet. So just, just in the span of like two generations, you've got these perspectives that, that are being imprinted upon you as a new Marine. I think that's the thing that that's really important for people to take away from is your actions, behaviors, the way you evaluate people, the way you mentor people, the way you train people, the way you set, set the conditions for success. Those things that you're doing on a daily basis could literally have the potential to be impacting the Marine Corps 30 years from today. Absolutely. Yep. And and the generations are all different, right? The ditty bopping, my generation is different than your generation, all that stuff. And does and you were talking about the entitlement and everything. It's always going to be like that. It's always going to be yeah. generation this, generation that. Marine Corps, I think, is a, is a hell of a lot better now than it was 30 years ago when I joined it. It's a hell of a lot better than the 30 years prior to when I joined it. And so that's a good point, Dave. That's a good point. Yeah, it's just kind of an interesting perspective in that, you know, if you're a battalion commander or a sergeant major or you're a company commander or a first sergeant, you're in a position where people are paying attention to what you're doing and what you're doing could impact somebody's perspective on leadership, either positively or negatively, that could have ramifications 30 years down the road. I mean, Sergeant Major in the Marine Corps, Sergeant Major Black had a very first platoon sergeant, had a very first platoon commander. And you don't think that their behaviors and actions and, and the way they led had any sort of formative impact on the Sergeant Major of the Marine Corps today? God damn right they did. Yeah, of course. I want to ask you a question real quick because it's it's affiliated with evaluations, but awards as well. What would have been your experiences with awards? And do you have any suggestions that could be useful to junior leaders right now uh, or junior leaders in the future as it relates to your experience over 20 years and now as a first sergeant, probably processing a lot of the administration with awards? Awards are a bit of a sensitive subject for me. I've, I've got my opinions, right? I, I've I've got some, like, I guess you'd call institutional opinions about awards. Some of those do include the entire DOD. Uh, I'll start with those and I'll keep that brief, right? I did not agree with the Valor device being removed from the service level achievement medals. And all I thought that all that would happen, all that would mean is less Lance Corporal Specialist Seaman and Airmen are going to get awarded for Valor, right? And uh, we've probably seen that within the last year. And I'm going to, I'm going to leave it at that. Well, explain that real quick to my generation, because I, I don't think that my generation understands the changes that have taken place unless they're really read in. What we have, you know, your generation would remember Navy Achievement Medal of Combat V, you know, Combat Distinguishing Advice. You know, the V mm -hmm. would go on the NAM, the Navy Accommodation Medal, Bronze Star, and uh, Air Medal, and Legion of Merit, I think, right? Okay. They no longer go on the Achievement Medal across all six services in the military. now. We have an addition of the C device, the combat C, which is essentially denoting that somebody had some achievement, meritorious achievement in a combat scenario, right? The C is authorized for the achievement medals, combination medals, and I think maybe one more, uh, and all the joint service medals, right? All the joint service okay. medals. And this is a DOD-wide thing yes. now, not just Marine Corps. Okay. Correct. This is a DOD-wide thing. I've seen... Combat C is being awarded for various things, and I think that's great. I think that a radio operator getting after it in a talk like in Iraq right now for the fight against ISIS and then getting awarded a, a, a Joint Service Achievement Medal with a Combat C to denote that he did a joint deployment and had achievement, meritorious achievement, I think it's great. I think it's great that the C came out. The fact that the V was removed from the Achievement Medal 
I think is a, a misstep because again, the reality is that's one less opportunity we can award service members for heroic achievement, right? When you read the citations for something with a V, it starts off with heroic achievement, right? You read a regular mm -hmm. one, it starts off with meritorious achievement, right? Professional achievement, things like that. I, I think it needs to be reevaluated, right? I, I really think that needs to be added back on there. And for a lot of, I won't really get too deep in it, but you know how it goes. And this stuff's been happening since World War II. It happened a lot in Vietnam. The abuse of the award system when it comes to Valor Awards. Look no further than President Lyndon Johnson's Silver Star. Just go read it, right? It is, a, you know, just we're talking a complete disparity between officer and enlisted awards, which I remember in 2005 timeframe before the Marine Corps Times like became a tabloid when they had a decent editor. They ran an article about the disparity between officer and enlisted valor awards, right? And it was very good. I don't know. And I don't feel like I'm out of place here. You know, I've, I've written witness citations for Bronze Stars of Valor. I, you know, I had to facilitate that posthumous Navy Cross recommendation. You know, I, I, I've seen this process, right? I've taken part in this process. Mm -hmm. I believe that we need to put that Valor device back on. And that's, that's all I'll say on that. When it comes to standard awards, right? You're talking, you know, letter of appreciation through, you know, meritorious service medals, right? Is typically what we're going to see at the battalion and below level. So your young leader, writing matters, being able to write uh, absolutely matters. Being able to convince somebody through your written words that that person performed those actions and that the performance of those actions had an effect on something, right? Had an effect on the Marines, had an effect on the battalion, regiment, squadron, group, etc. If you are a young leader or a young Marine and you are approached by a leader who says, I need a bulletized format of some of your performance during this period, because I want to put you in for a Navy Chief Medal, Navy Accommodation Medal, et cetera. Take some time and try not to be modest, right? Because I will tell you, after writing many awards, the better that the person does of trying to capture what they've done recently. I mean, some of them are easy. We just had a staff sergeant get out, Hunter Catlett, great, great guy. We wanted to put him in for a Navy Accommodation Medal. I said, hey, staff sergeant, please give me your billets or your bullets for the next last four years here in I&I duty. He gave them to me wrote that thing easily, right? I mean, he did He did a great job. He's a great writer, he, you know, and I was able to get it approved really easily, right? Just remember, somebody's got to write it. You got to give them a decent amount, unless it's like a valorous thing or a heroic thing, car accident, whatever, that you see happen. You need to get some decent information because the leader doesn't always see everything you do, doesn't understand right. the value of like the parts you requisitioned or the amount of patrolling you did or the, you know, you, your percentage of your, your squad that has made it through AIC first try or, you know, whatever. I do believe the Marine Corps, I think we are appropriately strict with our, our Navy achievement medals and our Navy combination medals. I think we are too strict with our meritorious service medals. You know, the meritorious service medal criteria if you haven't read it in the Navy and Marine Corps awards manual, it's very brief for the criteria for an MSM. That is a medal that is authorized for all six services, right? Mm -hmm. So the criteria can't be very strict, right? Because we have a different man, you know, we have a different institutional attitude about awards than the Air Force does. A major, the major in charge of that security forces squadron in Guam, he was authorized to award Air Force commendation medals. He's an 04. In the Marine Corps, Navy and Marine Corps accommodation medals are only authorized to be awarded by 06 commanders. There's right. a big institutional difference right there. Yes? Sure. Yeah. Now, the Meritorious Service Medal, I have written two Meritorious Service Medals for different Marines. One was written for a major retiring. He did a good job of giving me his information. It was approved. No problem. One, I attempted to write for a gunnery sergeant who is now a chief warrant officer too who is probably the most proficient, efficient, knowledge, you know, dedicated, and knowledgeable motor transport Marine in the entire Marine Corps, right? It's from New England too, so I'll give him that shut up. <laughs> and I could not get the battalion to entertain a gunnery sergeant being recommended for a meritorious service medal. So meritorious service medals, a lot of opinions come in here. You need to have upward effect, right? You need to be affecting you're at the battalion level, you need to be affecting the division or the regiment or institutional change. Well, like, okay. 
I've heard the institutional change won the most. So you're telling me that Sergeant Major over there with three meritorious service medals has changed the institution three separate times, right? Like, let, let's, let's be serious with this. I got it. I got it. We, we as an institution, as the United States Marine Corps, we are probably the only service that's really holding it down with not abusing the award system. And I'm not going to get into stuff I've seen in, in Iraq with the Army, with Bronze Stars, like not even going to get into it because I'm going to go off on a tangent, right? I think that eyebrows should not raise the second you start talking about a staff sergeant gunny, right? Getting a being recommended for a meritorious service medal when you can literally see them having an effect across if they're developing policy, right? That is going to be instituted at a major subordinate command level. That's pretty meritorious in my opinion, right? It's just interesting to me that every single time I'm in a battalion change of command or whatever, every single time, meritorious service medal, no matter what they did, deployed, whatever, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Like awarded, right? Yeah. But how do you take those observations and turn them into advice for someone listening who's a leader? What is the leadership lesson there that you can impart upon them that they can take away and say, yeah, you know what? Good point. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something about this. What I'm specifically talking about is a leadership lesson for senior leadership within a battalion, right? Company and, and battalion leadership to push the issue, right? The Marines deserve to be recognized. What, what is it? What does it, what does it matter? Now at the lower level, you're a corporal, you're a sergeant, and you want to recognize one of your Lance corporals for a, a Navy chief medal or something like that. Write it like literally Marine Corps order uh, 1650.1, right? It is the Navy Marine Corps awards manual, right? Get in there, research, write your Lance corporal for write the summary of action, write the citation. It's going to get red penned. I promise you. My, I, I wrote a uh, NCO the quarter recommendation yesterday for a sergeant. It got red penned by the captain, right? Or the major. It happens. Like, take the time. You want to talk about recognizing Marines? You got to write. Dollars to it. Someone's got to write it. Someone's got to do it. You got to do it. I mean, what I heard you say that was was really valuable was that as a leader, you need to be an effective writer. You do. Because you're trying to convince somebody who's reading a piece of paper that doesn't know this Marine that they deserve the award. Right. I mean, you're selling it. Mm -hmm. It's It is written salesmanship. Writing matters. I don't mean sales in a dirty word. I, you know, not talking about like the used car sales. I'm just saying like, you've, you've got to be able to effectively communicate why that Marine deserves something because it's going to be probably staffed through an awards board or something led by a Sergeant major who doesn't know anything about this Marine. Yep. And you also made an interesting comment that I think is worth punctuating a little bit too, which was, you know, when you're asked for bullets, we, we have this thing in the Marine Corps about being modest and, ah, uh, you know, right. uh, and and that doesn't help because if you're a leader and you're going to write a Marine up for a word and you're going to start with a word document in a, a blinking cursor on a blank page, that's a really hard thing to start with and just say, I'm going to write this Marine up for a word because you're starting with a blank document. Whereas if you have some memory joggers or just some information that helps them start to put words together on a blank document, it's just helpful. And, and nobody's suggesting that you lie or brag or embellish. It's just, hey, you know, help the person who's trying to do something for you by giving them information that makes the administrative part of it easier to do. That's it. It's kind of like the way you do billet descriptions. And Yeah, exactly. It's, if you get young Marines doing that as a Lance Corporal, by the time they're a sergeant, their first Marine reported on worksheet that they fill out for their finish reports isn't going to be a hot mess because right. they've, already, they've already broken through the barrier of talking about themselves, right? Officially yeah. writing about themselves, right? And they, in general, they've been writing. So they're, they're writing it, the actual writing itself, right? Not, you know, not the, the, the context, you know, the content, it will help them when they, when they get, you know, cause I mean, think about it. I've never written a fitness report, but I'll tell you right now, I'm sure a, a reporting senior, when they get a Marine report on worksheet from a sergeant above, if that Marine report on worksheet is a hot mess of punctuation and spelling errors and, and fumbled up sentences, is it, it's gotta be hard not to judge that person, Right. Yeah, it's got to be like it's human nature. Like, you know, I again never had to write fitness reports, but I've sure been a trusted assistant and reviewed plenty of them. Right, um, I've sure sat around uh, a table or a smoke pit and talked uh, over and over and over about evaluations and and all that uh, with Marines. So, yeah, I, th I think it's it, if we can get our Marines, you know, writing 
reading at an earlier period of their career, we can't go wrong. Like you're never going to look back and think, man, I wish I didn't know all that. You know what I mean? Like it's not going to happen. <laughs> right. Well, before we wrap up here, I just, I, I do want to talk a little bit about what you've got going on personally, some of your social media stuff, Okay. give everybody an opportunity to follow you there and learn a little bit more about what you're doing on the side outside of being a first sergeant. Yeah. So my retirement's approved, Dave, that was a hard choice to make, right? I will tell you that talent management 2030 is in full effect. I was contacted by some very senior people in the Marine Corps about my retirement. Talent Management 2030 has been communicated to all the monitors to have that conversation with people. So if you're a young leader out there, call your monitor, call them, just call them. Don't be afraid. Like master sergeant, master guns are going to pick up. They're going to talk to you. What do I have going on? You know, Constellation Group 138 is my Instagram page. Yeah. And we'll put that in the show notes too, so people can just click on it. Yeah. So that has been a concept for over a decade. I used to make Kydex holsters in my garage in Kent Pendleton and You know, when I met my business partner, Victor, at at MWC is 38, you know, we immediately got along. We're like, hey, we need to train these Marines. Like the mentality here is not warfighter. Like we need to make this happen. And and we did. We always talked about training civilians. I I 100% believe that every single American citizen uh, has the right to own a centerfire rifle with detachable magazine, body armor, you know, standard capacity magazines. You know, again, I'm from New England, Lexington Concord is right up the road. That's how we won our independence. And I'll never change my mind on that concept, right? Now, there's a lot of responsibility that goes with that. Victor and I plan to teach and uphold that responsibility to, you know, people on the range. So Constellation Group will eventually be a training company kind of on the weekends. We'll see where we go from there. I will always maintain a flavor of senior enlisted and then for Wolf or Victor, Chief Warrant Officer 2, leadership uh, on the page. I like doing the leadership highlights. I, I like talking about other people. The page itself was born out of, uh, in response to all the negativity on social media that was happening around 2019. I kind of fed off of uh, Major Schumann, old kill zone. And then Adam, you know, Adam Crick goons up. Probably the two that are most responsible for the uh, movement of uh, positivity with these pages. There was just so much negativity happening on social media surrounding the military in 2019 that I was convinced it was affecting good order and discipline. And in my that what that means to me is it was affecting our war fighting ability, right? I see people that mm-hmm. just don't care about their service. They just want to throw it all out the window. They just want to do jackassery all the time right there on social media. Like if they're not taking regular service seriously, they're not taking their MOS seriously, that means they're not. It means they're not a, a warfighter. Like that means they're not ready to 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 get after it, and that's what the Marine Corps does. So it's been fun. I mean, I've got so much engagement on there. <laughs> Sometimes this happens. I had a Marine send me a video last week of his squad watching the video of me explaining the force design update. That that's why yeah. I do it, right? That's why I'm doing it in in a military aspect because I can spread knowledge, right, and really collaborate knowledge because I learn a lot from the followers as well. Association with Patrol Base Abate. For any viewer or listener, Patrol Base Abate is a nonprofit started by Thomas Schumann, honors the memory of Sergeant Matthew Abate, and it's to combat uh, veterans' uh, suicide and to maintain our tribe as veterans, right? So, Dave, what's your position, board member? I'm on the board of directors, correct? Yeah. So, I do not currently have a, I guess, a billet in PB Abate. Uh, I kind of had to withdraw from billet responsibilities until after I retire. However, I am associated with the gun club and I'm actively working a couple different gun club events, one in central Texas and then one in uh, north of Scottsdale, Arizona. So PB Bate is like my like, in, you know, need to satisfy service right in retirement. Right. I'm always going to be connected with the, the military, connected with the Marine Corps in some manner. The patrol base of Bate events are great. You can have a Phantom Fury door kicker, like having a beer right next to Army logistics officer who just got out after four years, right? You know, they yeah. pay for these veterans to go up to these, like, these events across the country, you know, up in the mountains in Montana, super clean, super, super clean air, clean eating, you know, a, a, a uh, substance-free atmosphere where you're learning something about fitness or reading, you know, brotherhood, sisterhood with the with the tribe. It, phenomenal organization. So I, I do intend to to be part of PB Bate. Uh, but honestly, Dave, like the most important thing that I got going on 
is getting back to my family time. Like I've been geo bachelor either overseas or weekly, not seeing my family during the week for like two plus year, two and a half years now trying to put my, you know, my family in a position where I'm home more hours than I've ever been in my retirement, you know, putting myself in a position where I can support my, my wife's uh, career goals. Right. That's why I'm retiring. You know, I mean, I was probably competitive for Sergeant Major based off my fitness reports, but you know what? Like yeah, I'm sure leadership, final leadership lesson, right, Dave? Like you got to mm-hmm. know when to hang it up. You know, it would have been more of a selfish decision for me to stay in, go to first Marine division. Cause it was offered by the way, go to first Marine division as a first sergeant for a little bit, get promoted to Sergeant Major, get after it with the young Marines, right? The Marines who are more prepared for combat right now than they ever have been more equipped. They're smarter, they're more well, they're, they're better trained force design, get behind it. It's rad. It would have been, I would have been into it, completely into it, right? The leadership lesson is know when it's time to move on, right? Because the family is is going to be there. The Marine Corps will leave at some point, right? So, and if you've done it right, there's people below you that have taken a couple cues from you that are ready to step up and take your place. Right. To- totally agree with all of that. I will just conclude this by coming back to your comment about the social media and the negativity. And and I'll say this to leaders out there. This is very reminiscent to me, the adoption of social media as a platform for communicating and actually leading is very reminiscent of the adoption of email back when I was on active duty and computers were becoming more ubiquitous. And, and there was that attitude of, Oh, I don't need that email shmemail thing. You know, that's, that's, you know, America online, you know, like all this, the adoption of the technology was issued by a lot of leaders who just, you know, didn't want to change too stuck in their ways, whatever it was, saw it as some sort of, you know, silly thing to do. And if leadership isn't involved in social media, the space is seceded to people who want to spread negativity, which is what you were seeing in 2019, right? I mean, like, yeah. you don't want to adopt it, you don't want to be involved in it, you see that space to somebody else's mission or, and, and messaging, I should say, not mission messaging. Right. So get involved. Yeah. Right. And, and I see like you and Tom and, and Blake and a lot of other people in there, communicator, EL leader. I mean, all these people in there, like spreading positivity and talking about things that are really important and transferring, like you said, transferring and collaborating on leadership and knowledge, knowledge transfer and collaboration that's happening and it's erasing a lot. I, I don't even follow the negative, the the memes no. and things like that. They're making fun of the, I'll follow one or two just to get a chuckle every yeah. now and then. But most of the time when I see meme pages, I'm like, I'm, I'm not even following that. I'm just not getting yeah. anything out of it. It's just, they're funny. I'm not saying, not taking anything away, but like Adam Crick and all the positivity there and, and the MOS specific pages, I think it's awesome. Heavily suppressed. All these great pages that are talking, that are just really spreading positivity about the service and everything because- you know, don't get involved in social media. You see that space over to the 10% of the disgruntled people yeah. and it makes it seem like everybody hates it. Yeah. And, and I don't know, think that's true. So the amount of messages I've got from members of fourth Marine division, thanking me for putting some, you know, emphasizing some fourth Mar Div pride, right. Some reserve yeah. division pride for those that don't know Marine Corps has four divisions and the fourth, you know, the fourth division is reserve, you know, there's always that reserve versus act or activity versus reserve, blah, 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 blah. But I'm telling you like, throwing up a fourth mar div patch or throwing it on my back like i'm the active duty i and i first sergeant but i i i wear a fourth marine division patch on the back of my my patrol pack right like there's value in that there's value in, in fostering unit pride right and you know it's a contentious thing but there's a movement to get unit patches back on the left shoulder of our uniforms right that, that's something that the marine corps wants at least in the divisions right social media can accelerate that stuff right and we see it all the time Look. I'm not the leader who's going to sit there on social media in my car and run my mouth with like legitimate, like motivational talk, right? It's just not me, right? I'm not the guy who's going to do bicep curls in the gym. You know, I'm not all about the girl who just does like extensions and and these and some people who use the uniform as a bit of a prop, right? I would much rather share a historical story, highlight the, my favorite thing to do is highlight other, uh, other leaders, right? Uh, the one right. I did recently with that veteran of two one for Kabul. I took him to the range and we just blasted off a bunch of rounds, did a training session. He was an O three eleven, 
he'd never shot an M1 Garand before. So I was like, oh, I got you, man. You're going to, you're going to shoot this rifle, man. You, yeah. You're, you're part of the main I saw that universe. on social media. It was awesome. Yeah. It was awesome. You know, that, that's the stuff I love doing, right? Yeah. You know, some leaders don't want to be in the, in the space, right? And it's fine, right? However, don't discourage other people from doing it as long as they're not, as long as they're right. not sharing anything that's sensitive. And if it, yeah. it's, to me, if it's about war fighting, I'm down with it. Sure. And to me, it's all about, hey, if, if you're, if you're spreading positivity about command or leadership or knowledge or reading or whatever, whatever your jam is, as family long as you're being too. positive about, yeah, and family, yeah, family. Or, or any of that. And there's a yeah. lot of accounts out there that are doing that. Yep. And yeah, some people are into history. Some people are into whatever it is. As, as long as you're spreading some positivity, I've seen some great, really, really great battalion pages that are coming out, like Lieutenant Colonel Kerrigan, who's got one eight down there mm-hmm. in Camp Lejeune. I mean, his... Instagram page is full of positivity, reenlistment ceremonies, yep. PMEs that they're doing. It's just fantastic. And he, he, and I don't even know him personally. I, you know, I'm digital acquaintances with him, but he's spreading so much positivity and everything. I, I look at that and I think here's a guy who has refused to cede the space to negative people posting. He is part of the adoption and the appropriate application of this as a medium in a way right. that I think sets an example. Lieutenant General Bellin, you know, he refuses to see this space to the negativity he's running. He and his Sergeant major are running fantastic. Mm-hmm. I'd love to see some more unit pages out there. Just, you know, doing it. HMLA 267 has got a great page. Yep. I, I love seeing it. I love seeing people saying like, Hey, I'm going to be part of the solution. I'm not going to see this space to the negative people who are just spreading what I think to be not really accurate information and more just disgruntled opinion based on their own personal observations or issues they had. Concur. Yeah. Doesn't mean some of them aren't funny though. Yeah, <laughs> right? some, of like some, some of them are. Some of them are funny, funny. right? And yeah. and I love, I love a good laugh. I just, uh, yeah, I can only take so much of it. So anyway, first sergeant Seamus Flynn, uh, he's the I and I first sergeant down at Weapons Company One Twenty Three in Austin, Texas. This has been a great chat about leadership. Really appreciate you taking time on a on a Saturday, an early Saturday morning for you to share some of your experiences and your moments in leadership with emerging leaders across the force. And for those of you out there who are, who are listening, I'll have all the links to the show note in the show notes to all the social media pages, the constellation group, everything that we mentioned earlier. And, uh, Hey, first on really appreciate you coming on and, and taking the time to, to, to make the Marine Corps and the DOD a better place by sharing your, your experiences. Thank you very much for coming on the show. Welcome, Thanks for having me.